Recording in progress. Wasn't that magical? <laughs> you didn't know I can do different voices, did you? <laughs> oh, welcome to our city council uh, afternoon session. Uh, before we begin, as always, we want to have our outstanding city clerk explain how people can participate in this meeting. So we'll go ahead and turn it over to Clementine, please. Yes, thank you. For safe attendance of this public meeting, masks are strongly recommended for those who attend in person, regardless of vaccination status, except those who are younger than two or have a medical condition that prevents wearing a mask. Please keep your phones and devices muted in the council chamber to prevent audio interference. And there are two ways to virtually participate in today's meeting. You may join us using the Zoom app on your computer or mobile device, and you can also call into the Zoom meeting. To join the meeting on Zoom on your computer, smartphone, or telephone, use the link or phone number on the agenda at iSearchMonterey.org. An up-to-date version of the Zoom software must be used. To call in by telephone, dial toll-free 833-568-8864 and enter meeting ID 160-772-9333-POUND. And if prompted to enter a participant ID, press pound. Detailed instructions on using and updating Zoom are available at monterey.org slash public meetings. To make a public comment using the Zoom app, you can virtually raise your hand by pressing the raise hand button at the bottom of your screen. If you dialed in by phone, raise your hand by dialing star nine and then unmute yourself when you're called upon by dialing star six. You must do both. Public commenters will be muted until it is their turn to speak. We'll call on each public speaker in the order of their hands raised. Please stay within the time limit established for today's meeting and a countdown timer will be shown on the screen. If you're connected live on Zoom, the timer is accurate with no delay. Today's meeting is also streamed live on the city's YouTube account at youtube.com slash city of Monterey with about 10 seconds delay and on Comcast channel 25 up to 90 seconds delay. And we look forward to receiving your public comment as always. And as always, uh, well presented. Thank you so much. And We'll call the meeting to order. Welcome everyone in our council chambers as well as online. And we'll let the record show that four of us are here in person. And uh, we have, of course, uh, Alan Hoffa, uh, who's with us for, on Zoom. So we, we're all here and uh, time to celebrate and do some presentations. So let's switch back here. You know, we only have three screens to keep track of. Uh -huh. <laughs> so the first thing we're going to do is recognize July as Parks and Recreation Month. And of course, in the city of Monterey, we have one of the best parks and recreation departments anywhere, not just for a city of our size, but absolutely anywhere. And uh, recently in the news was the Monterey Sports Center, and we're eternally grateful for the Neighborhood and Community Improvement Program. Thank you, Lee and others who have uh, helped with the renovation of the humidifier in the sports center, along with other citywide projects. So what I'd like to do is share a proclamation. And as I do so, you can just think about how this applies to our beautiful city. So whereas Parks and Recreation recognizes the importance of access to local parks, recreation, trails, open space, and facilities for all citizens, all of which we have. And Parks Recreation promotes physical, emotional, and mental health and wellness through organized and self-directed fitness, play, and activity. Just think about all of our youngsters this uh, summer who are participating in our different programs, which is not only beneficial to our youngsters, but their parents as well. The Parks and Recreation supports the economic vitality of communities by providing frontline jobs, partnering with local businesses and nonprofits, and offering events for residents' engagement. It fosters social cohesiveness in communities by celebrating diversity, providing spaces to come together peacefully, modeling compassion, promoting social equity, connecting social networks, and Parks and Rec strengthens community identity by providing facilities and services that celebrate our community character, heritage, culture, history, aesthetics, and landscape. And as I read this, I don't know if you're doing it too. I, my, my mind is just playing a little reel of, I'm thinking of the sports center, I'm thinking of our community centers uh, and uh, our recreational trip, our, our beaches and 
our newest acquisition, our forest uh, in the old capital site. And Parks and Recreation facilitates community problem and issue resolution by providing safe spaces to come together peacefully and facilitating conversation and services in order that our communities may heal both physically and emotionally. Parks and Recreation sustains and stewards our natural resources by protecting habitats and open space, connecting people to nature, and promoting the ecological function of parkland. Parks and Recreation remains versatile and innovative in providing vital services to, to, through, to communities through local, national, and global emergencies. And Parks and Recreation supports safe, vibrant, attractive, progressive communities that make life better through positive alternatives offered in their recreational opportunities. So it's my pleasure that as the mayor, I can proclaim along with the city council on behalf of all of our citizens to recognize the month of July as Parks and Recreation Month in the city of Monterey. And always that's a year round celebration that we have. So uh, I'll ask our esteemed city manager, was anything that uh, you or staff wanted to add? I know we have Karen here, Louis, Shannon, and Andrea. From yeah, we, we have our, our department. Thank you for being here. Yeah, th thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I think Karen wanted to say a few words, okay. Karen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and council members for recognizing July 2022 as Parks and Recreation Month in the city of Monterey. I'd like to express my sincere appreciation for the hard work and dedication for all of the city of Monterey Parks and Recreation employees and volunteers, as well as the leadership of the city council, the advocacy of the Parks and Recreation Commission, and the support of the community. The 2022 slogan for Parks and Recreation Month is We Rise Up, as our profession commits to rising up for our community, for access to play, for mental well being, for physical health, for resilience, and for inclusion. And it's truly an honor and a privilege to serve the city of Monterey, as well as to work alongside Shannon Leon, our recreation manager, Louis Marcuso, our park operations manager, and Dr. Andrea Willer, our sports center manager, along with their respective teams. So thank you again, and I hope you'll make an extra effort to get out and enjoy a multitude of recreational activities this month. Thank you. And as we hopefully are recovering from the pandemic, see our facilities stay open for our clients, as well as our students. Very important. And so, continuing in the spirit of celebration, it's a real pleasure to recognize Rick Johnson on his retirement as the executive director of the Old Monterey Business Association. And again, I have a proclamation I, I want to share. And as we know, our, our still Rick Johnson, always still Rick Johnson to us, he's a very humble person and he's gonna be squirming as we say all these great things about him. <laughs> and I hope you, uh, you heard, you might were too busy when we were doing our 4th of July celebration, we uh, gave you a huge shout out and all the people there, visitors, people who work here, people who live here gave you a really great ovation. I don't know if you heard it, you were probably still cleaning up after the parade, but you were much appreciated in the community. So I'm gonna share this with great pleasure. Rick Johnson, Executive Director of the Old Monterey Business Association, as well as New Monterey Business Association, has been an integral part of the downtown Monterey community for over 22 years, from 2000 to 2022. During Rick's tenure, he established himself as an avid listener, steadfast mentor, creative problem solver, community builder, bridger of competing perspectives, cheerleader extraordinaire, thoughtful speaker, rouser of enthusiasm, I must tell you that our staff put this together, shows you how much they appreciate and know you. 
Uh, Mr. Johnson displayed a positive and happy demeanor, even when he had to say no. And Rick made an appealing, inviting and clean and safe downtown a priority, including lining Alvarado Street and the Alvarado Mall with custom celebratory banners. And Rick Johnson has an incredibly keen ability to accurately assess the size of a crowd of events. <laughs> you know who wrote, Rick, you know who wrote that one. <laughs> Hi, I'm sorry. It's okay. Mr. Johnson has attended city council meetings to provide praise and encouragement to the mayor, councils and staff alike which he has done, and we always appreciate that. And during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic from March 2020 to today, Mr. Johnson supported the downtown businesses and helped them adapt with outdoor seating and adding online purchasing options. And the city of Monterey, in a sense, was a leader in outdoor dining before the pandemic, but then really did increase. And I know you helped that happen in New Monterey as well. And interestingly enough, while other cities are arguing about do they want to continue outdoor dining and so on, it's become really part of the fabric of our city. It's very special, and we thank you for that, Rick. Rick Johnson helped lead and promote the revitalization of its Happening Now campaign of Old Town Monterey during his two-decade term and helped establish the Old Monterey Foundation in 2011. He was instrumental in the success of many holiday and other special events sp sponsored by the City of Monterey, the Old Monterey Business Association, the Old Monterey Foundation, First Night Monterey, Big Sur Marathon Foundation, and many others. And I don't think any of those events would have been successful without Rick's presence. Rick streamlined the old Monterey farmers market and marketplace to process both for merchants and visitors, making it a local favorite. And he worked closely as a legendary liaison between the Monterey Conference Center and local businesses to create a successful experience for visitors. So again, it's uh, my pleasure to proclaim on, the, on behalf of the council and the entire city that we thank Rick Johnson for his dedication and genuine commitment to our community. We wish him much happiness in his retirement. And we should probably add one more line or your next adventures, because Rick is not one of those people who's going to retire. He's definitely just such a good friend, uh, Rick of, uh, of Monterey. We're gonna miss you, but you'll be around. So it'd be a real pleasure if uh, you would come forward with, your lovely bride, if she wants to join you, and oh. your proclamation fell out of the uh, third. <laughs> Why don't we have everybody come out, uh, our council come up? Can you go where you want? Okay. Chief, come on up, Chief Dave Hans. Anyone else here? And yeah, yeah. Everybody that's worked with uh, him over so much over the years. I'm going to come down in front if I can. So I can put a photo off here. I'll look at my. Can you take our masks off for like a 20 seconds here just for a photo as, we, as we're ready? Don't breathe. Okay. Hold the breath. Off over the arrow. <laughs> Everybody like it? Back? All right. You got it. All right. One, two, three, big smile. Perfect. Really closely with your community, citizens, neighborhoods, city councils over the years. 
and also a really great friend of the city staff. So what I want to do is invite our city manager, Hans Uslar, who has something that you'll enjoy. He's gonna to have to explain to everybody in Del Rio, so where did you get this? <laughs> you'll see. <laughs> so, uh... Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Rick, um, congratulations on a well-deserved retirement. Um, a lot of things have been said in the proclamation. Um, I always enjoyed estimating crowds together with you. Um, uh, also, what I really enjoyed also was your cheerleading of so many things. And, and you uh, always brought a positive attitude to, to the council, whether you presented uh, on behalf of OMBA or you just showed up to to spread some joy and we were all scared why is he here and uh, you were just talking about something going on in the community and you wanted to share it and i uh, know that this is was always well received so uh, as we speak right now the streets on alvarado street are being changed to the rick johnson way um we we made a street sign for you and we uh, so that was a joke uh, so don't nobody Mr. Alvarado, whoever that might be, uh, will will be mad. Um, so this is the original sign that they made because we have a supply chain issue and uh, we don't have the green stock anymore. But knowing and coming from public works, we had a secret stock somewhere. I always know that we have secrets. Uh -huh. So we gave you the real one and one for, for the garage. So this is for, for a, a fireplace at home. And then the other one you can put into the garage and a lot of staff members and council members have signed it and have expressed their gratitude to you. And um, even though you live in Delray Oaks, uh, you're welcome anytime back to City Hall. Thank you for everything. Thank you. Um, I'm almost speechless, almost being <laughs> a word here. Um, I'll keep it short though, because you did teach me in 22 years, you have three minutes. So, um, you know, I came to Monterey in 1968 as a 19 year old soldier at DLI, and I got off the plane. And I looked around and I thought, I just landed in heaven. Now, I'd left Minnesota and it was 20 below zero. So uh, I did find out in these 22 years um, with the city, working with and with my friends in the city, that I was absolutely right in 1968. What we have here is something nobody else has anywhere. So it's been an honor. Actually, it's been the greatest honor of my life um, to work with everyone, all the staff and the elected officials in Monterey, my friends, is really the honor. And I thank you for that. And with that, if anyone's watching um, from home, when this breaks, please go down to the farmer's market on Alvarado Street. We'll be there till eight o'clock. And... Um, Everyone, everyone needs to be so proud of who we are, businesses, residents, for all one community. And I've been blessed to be part of it. Thank you. Pardon me? Can you hold your speech sign up for me? Sure. Yeah, following directions were not always his strength. Thank you. Thank you. Remember, Rick Johnson's way is the right. <laughs> now, uh, Mr. Rick Johnson, before you leave, uh, I think some council members would like to share some thoughts as well. So. We feel have a seat, and we'll start with uh, Council Member Dan. Like when I uh, when I read the agenda, it didn't say uh, New Monterey Business Association, so I thought microphone, please. Mike, thank you. So 
Rick, when I looked at the agenda, it didn't say new Monterey Business Association. So I thought, did he change his mind? But uh, obviously not. Uh, I worked with Rick now for six years as the representative of the new Monterey Business Association. Mm -hmm. I appreciate all Rick has done for the that business uh, area because it's a very unique um, it's a very unique to our city, and uh, I think you've done a, a great job, obviously. Uh, they, they say that Mike Murata is the mayor of Alvarado, but really, truly, you are the mayor of Alvarado, Rick. So thank you very much for all your hard work. Uh, you've been a, a real mentor to me, and I appreciate that, Rick. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, Councilmember Alan Hoppe with his hand raised. Alan, please. Yeah, Rick, I'm Rick, I'm sorry I couldn't be there to uh, personally thank you and congratulate you for um, for all of your accomplishments. I wanted to highlight a couple things. Um, I had the chance to work with Rick back in 2014 on Measure P, and then again on, on Measure S. You know, to to improve our streets and sidewalks throughout the city. And Rick, you were a very important part of that team. And um, I haven't forgotten making phone calls with you. And I, I really appreciated that at the time. And I think it was critical to uh, the success we had passing that measure. Rick was also obviously an integral player in the downtown specific plan. I think we approved that in 2013, might've been 2012, I can't remember. Mm -hmm. And the success of the downtown specific plan, I think really is obvious to anyone who's seen the downtown over the years and what it is today. And I think you were really important in helping council and staff kind of find the right, you know, the right balance uh, in developing that plan. And on a personal level, I just want to thank you. You're someone that um, I could feel comfortable talking with about um, city issues, about business and about business districts. And I always knew 100% that you were um, a straight shooter. I could trust what you had to say and um, just really appreciated the way you represented um, the various business districts. Thank you. Council Member Tyler. So I, uh, I, I really don't know uh, what to say about Rick. I mean, um, I, I, I will stay, um, just forever joyful for having interacted with you and uh, shared um, so many personal experiences with you. Every time that we have an interaction, um, I can't help but just crack up and, and enjoy it. Um, and uh, I, I will never be able to replace something like that. You're such an amazing human being. Um, you're the type of people that should be stepping into positions of leadership because it's not like you need it. You don't, um, you know, you're not reaching for that that power for sake of power. You're doing it because you really care about the community and the work that's being done. And I so much honor you for that um, and look up to you in many ways. So um, I look forward to continuing the, the relationship with you. I, I do know that you'll, you'll stay active and and um, maintain, maintain the relationship and uh, your role in the community. So thank you so much for all you've done, Rick. Uh, yeah, is this when the roast gets started? <laughs> uh, so, hey, there's a lot to roast Rick, and it's all very positive. Rick has been such a strong partner of the city and a, and a friend to so many people and with the initiatives that's already been cited here. One of the things for me that stands out, Rick, and getting to, to represent this council on the old Monterey Business Association is to be able to see how efficient you work, how strategic you work, and how you handle the board. And I say that with the representation of being on a board, sometimes we need to be handled because boards can get a little bit left and right. And Hans can tell you that privately too. But you do a masterful job at helping to support your board with the efforts in Old Monterey Business Association, which I would put out a plug for the new executive director, Peter Confresi. And Peter, congratulations. Um, Peter's gonna do a great job because one of your skills, Rick, you have thought in terms of succession planning, you thought about moving forward, what happens when, 
And uh, the businesses that are held together in that association are going to be served well because you have spent time, your efforts, and you provided us with uh, an option in Peter. So thank you very much. Um, Peter, you're going to have to fill big shoes. Um, I know that he'll always answer your phone calls. Uh, even the ones you call him at six o'clock in the morning, he'll be on it. Um, <laughs> Rick is a well-known walker downtown, and as a matter of fact, uh, he has two replacements of his hips because he walked them, he walked them <laughs> off downtown. So Peter, big shills to the shoes to fill. Uh, we're going to miss you seeing you, but we know you'll be engaged and active and involved. We'll get to see you at lots of other things, and uh, we'll have a glass of wine at social occasions and celebrate what you've done. These last 22 years are magnificent. Um, you're a proud member of Monterey uh, Downtown USA. You brought uh, a face to us. You put identity to us in many ways. It's what you did with your association and your presence in downtown that the rest of the world knows downtown Monterey. We much greatly appreciate all you've done. And to Chris, thank you for your sacrifices and time. We know you'll get him more now. Um, but maybe you don't want him in the way. <laughs> As you were busy running your business also in the district at Copy King, um, I have the privilege of having an office that I work out of on Cali Prince Pal. So I get to see Chris and Rick often. And I hope to still see Rick whenever he's bored at home or gets kicked out of Copy King. <laughs> My door is always open for you to come by for a cup of coffee. And Rick, congratulations again to you. Job well done. Well said, everybody. And, and of course, we all add our appreciation to Chris, who's one of uh, Gracie's favorite people. And Gracie's our rat terrier. So whenever we walk downtown, she actually knows how to get in the front door. Then she goes back and she runs around in the back and gets a lot of attention. And so, she, in fact, the, the dog, she, she knows you guys and loves you guys as long with the rest of us. So we thank you so much. So. And with that, we have the Christmas tree lighting that you've done over the years and Farmer's Market, the parade. And so we know uh, you'll be there to mentor and help people coordinate that. That's just an amazing amount of work. And the fact that you were able to bring our parade back after our two years of COVID and in shelter, and it was as successful as ever. That's just another example of how well you do things. So once again, thanks so much. And you might want to just stay a little bit longer. At this point, uh, a former mayor, Dan, used to say, now, if you all want to leave, it won't hurt our feelings. <laughs> <laughs> but stick around because I think this is kind of fun, too. And that is another recognition of city employees for milestone anniversaries. Now, I'm going to ask the city manager to uh, introduce the first honoree, but not the second one. That would be a little bit awkward. You'll see why. <laughs> so Hans, we're able to celebrate uh, Gunder Redke this evening. Yeah, uh, we're celebrating Gunder Redke. She um, has retired uh, quite a while, uh, two, three months ago. And I mm -hmm. think we honored her in front of the council as part of the retirement. But we yeah. felt obligated also to mention her as part of that quarter of retirees and anniversaries that we are celebrating. And Fire Chief Penholzer uh, will does have a few words to say, even though she was not able to make it to family. Yeah. Well, welcome. Good evening, uh, or good afternoon, I guess, Mayor and members of the council and members of the public. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say a few words as we're struggling here to keep the ship afloat without Gundy. Yeah. Um, she was actually honored recently for her 20 years of service with the city, and now she retired effective June 2nd was her first day of retirement. Mm -hmm. And I, I can't say enough about how critical she was to my being successful as a fire chief, especially early on. There's always somebody who knows the ins and outs of things and understands the details, especially of the complex contracts we have with various other jurisdictions. And, and Gundy knew those front, frontwards and backwards and, uh, and was well-versed and, and helped me get, get control of that and understanding of that. Um, and uh, I know that right now, if she were if she were listening, but I know she's on vacation on the East Coast and that's why she's not uh, 
participating today, but she would probably keep track of everything that was going on in a spreadsheet because that's what her strength was. Everything was in a spreadsheet and explained by a spreadsheet. So um, we, we totally miss her. We're fortunate that we found a good replacement, but uh, to absolutely wish her all the best in her retirement. All right, thank you, Chief Gaudens. Appreciate that. And uh, and I, I certainly understand all of us who've been in, in in any kind of business or job. There's certain key people that you want to know who know everything. And and for the fire department was Gundy as an elementary school teacher. He wanted to be best friends with the secretary and the custodian mm -hmm. because they knew everything that was going on in the district and could make life miserable for you if you didn't appreciate them. Right? <laughs> Not that Gundy ever did that. Now, the next uh, person, as I said, would be awkward to introduce because it's our own city manager, Hans Usler, who is celebrating his 25th years of service to our city. And I'm personally so grateful that he has been our city manager over the last four years, guided us through the pandemic, made a lot of really courageous decisions to keep us all healthy. And what I like so much is Hans started off and he worked his way up through the organization. And to me, that's really important to be constantly training people to step up so they can take over leadership roles because they know the organization and they have the history. And in every function that Hans has had in my interactions with him, always professional, always first class, and always direct. And I appreciate that very much too. You don't just want somebody who doesn't tell you what they think because that's how we learn and, and so how we do better. And so Hans, we could go on forever and, but just want you to know you're appreciated, uh, 25 years of service. And that's just amazing. And wherever I go throughout town, people are always saying, we're so grateful that Hans Uslar is our city manager. You here at Rick downtown, it doesn't matter. Neighborhoods, business associations, hospitality. Everybody appreciates you. And I think, Nat, do you have uh, something? Yes. Oh, that's an award. You probably see uh, uh, people wearing Monterey City pins. And I think Hans has one on, but this one is, a, he's gonna be a double lapel pin wearer or something. Hey, Rick, we can open a concession downtown. <laughs> Farmer's market. Let's do city pins. We'll make a, a but anyway, this is for a 25 year pin. And we'll wear it proudly. And thank you so much. Yes. So honesty, integrity, ethics. That's our city manager. All right. Let's see, now I have to jump back here. You're kind of getting it, Tyler. Going, getting to consent. Yeah. Yes, I do. All right. Well, we, uh, we're gonna do public comments. Yeah. And public comments uh, in, in this stage are anything not on the agenda. This gives you all an opportunity to share anything that uh, you wish. If you have a comment on the agenda, we would uh, request that you wait until that item comes up. And as always, if you will leave a contact now or later, you will hear from our outstanding staff. And you can always share your thoughts at suggest at moderate.org as well. So with that, we'll open it up for any public comments not on the agenda with three minutes. And please, within the jurisdiction of the city of Monterey. So do we have anyone uh, here in our chambers who wanted to give a public comment? Seeing none, is there anyone uh, online in the queue who wanted to share some thoughts this evening? I do see one telephone caller, Mr. Mayor, and this is someone whose phone number ends in 902. So please unmute yourself and go right ahead. Thank you. Um, this is Nina Beatty. Last week, the Parks and Recreation Department cut down a tree in my neighborhood without notice and without contacting the neighbors. It posed no danger. It was providing benefits of habitat, shade, moisture, food, oxygen, and presence. I want this stump left so that the tree can regrow and continue living here. It was eucalyptus. 
The department also cut down a palm tree and another eucalyptus on Pacific. No danger, only benefit. Climate change, oxygen declines, habitat loss, droughts. These trees help with all of that, including ion exchange that brings range, which we need. Eucalyptus were on this continent millions of years before their fossils are found in Australia. They are native, unlike the European humans in Monterey. Eucalyptus trees sequester water and are an excellent fire ba barrier. The reason the Oakland fire wasn't much, much worse, according to the fire investigation, was they and other trees kept the fire from going over the hill east and causing many, many deaths. They provide winter food for birds, bees, and butterflies, and Califor Carmel Art Galleries have expensive paintings featuring this iconic California tree. My eucalyptus neighbor wasn't even propagating. Parks and Rec has bought into an antiquated nativist ideology that scientists are abandoning as not scientific, not resilient, not inclusive. Eucalyptus and all trees are our relatives, sentient, collaborative species, persons just as you and me. Trees are the most beneficial and non-harming species along with bees and butterflies. I told the city over 10 years ago to use NIP funds to enroll staff in permaculture design workshops to learn how to work with nature. No one was interested in making an exception to NIP rules and making Monterey a demonstration of a vibrant urban environment that draws visitors and partners with experts at Esalen and Santa Cruz in creating lush vegetation and healthy forests. So what do we have? Lots of room for improvement, ignorance and apathy. Habitat is mischaracterized as fuel, disrespected and eliminated, causing bare, compacted, eroded ground, rising temperatures in formerly cool and protected areas, and no place for nature and stressing forests. Mm -hmm. Janista is food for wildlife and shelter for their young, and they can survive under the harsh conditions humans have created. Trees are on water like the redwoods on Moonris. The city got rid of its water trucks. How do you water trees and vegetation? The pine tree on the Del Monte median that's suffering because the city planted it on a peak and the water runs off instead of infiltrating. The Mexican sage whacked to the ground on Soledad Drive and the flowering trees, cherry trees killed. Bushes planted over water conduits with no room for roots and on. And it hurts not just the trees and the vegetation, but all the wildlife, our relatives, and ignoring the contribution, ignoring their contribution uh, and this, these actions contribute to climate change, oxygen loss, and drought. I vote for improving parks and recreation so that they benefit all the re residents, including nature, and, and I can provide you with more detailed information. That's all. All right, thank you, Ms. Beattie. And um, uh, Mr. Mayor, there are no further hands raised. All right, we'll close the uh, public comment section and go right ahead into the consent. Uh, was there anyone in the public that we know of who wanted to pull a consent item? Yes, Mr. Mayor, uh, staff request to pull item 14 and uh, item 16 has been requested to be pulled by a member of the public. Okay, now did you say you were, we were tabling 14 or? Uh, no, we, Mr. Uh, Uslar will, or I, I'm happy to as well. Uh, item 14 uh, has a request to uh, make changes regarding three positions. We're requesting to remove the engineering assistant to position from the resolution at the request of the uh, labor uh, union representing that position at this time. All right. And so was there uh, any public comment on that that we know of? Not that we know of. Okay. So we can make that uh, correction part of the uh, consent agenda motion then. Mm -hmm. All right. Then we're going to pull item 16. Okay. And so was there any public comment on any of our consent for folks who are here? or online? I don't uh, see not online. Here. One here that I can see. All right. Council questions, ready to go. No. Want anything pulled? Um, no, and if there's not, I'll, I'll make a motion to uh, uh, pass forward all the items listed with the exception of 16 in the consent agenda. Second. All right, roll call please. And just to clarify with the mover and the seconder that that includes the amendment recommended by staff on item 14. That's correct. Okay. Um, Councilmember Smith. Yes. Councilmember Williamson. Yes. Councilmember Albert. Yes. Councilmember Hoffa. Yes. And Mayor Roberson. A yes for me. All right. So let's go back to 16. Uh, we were awarding Americans with Disability Act transition plan update professional services contract. Uh, let's have a brief uh, presentation, then we'll open it up to uh, the public. 
Mayor Berberson, this will be a very brief verbal presentation. Uh, what staff is recommending tonight is for council to award a contract to Jensen Hughes in a not to exceed amount of $212,660 to update the ADA transition plan. A total of three proposals were submitted and were reviewed by the city manager's office, public works and the building and safety inspection division. Happy to answer any questions you may have. All right, let's, uh, before we do that, let's uh, have, uh, we had someone from the public who wanted to speak to this. And was that person here or uh, online? Yes, that person is, um, I believe, Ms. Beattie. Um, Ms. Beattie, go ahead, please. All right, welcome back, Ms. Beattie. Great, um, a transition plan is long overdue. I'm glad that it's being considered now. I'm disabled by electromagnetic sensitivity and the city has blocked me and refused my request for reasonable disabled accommodation since 2008. Will That's my mistake, I'm so sorry. Um, please go ahead. Okay. Will this transition plan be thorough, objective and accurate or will it fall in line with city prejudices and past conduct? Other city consultants have provided biased and even false information in their reports in line with staff stated biases that have interfered with any accommodation I might have received. For 14 years, city staff have engaged in ruses, misrepresentation and mischaracterization of my requests and state and federal laws, intimidation and frightening acts to block me from any accommodation or even to be able to live in Monterey, which also falls into Fair Housing Act. They have displayed willful indifference to what federal and state laws require, erecting more and more barriers in public facilities over my objections. There are other people in the city disabled like me, and the city has heard from them and ignored them. That's not your option. Federal and state laws don't permit you to do that. I'm not there in the city council chambers because city staff chose to install Wi-Fi instead of wired internet, despite knowing this is an access barrier. I cannot attend city hearings safely there due to this barrier. So the city will have to demonstrate a complete sea change in attitude, action, and policy toward me and the other disabled people like me. And this contractor will have to demonstrate integrity, competence, and federal and state anti-discrimination rules, and a commitment to compliance. I request to be added to the project mailing list, and I will be submitting comments and evidence to this contractor. I was not notified of this meeting or the transition plan project, despite that I have requested a transition plan repeatedly from you. I expect the city and the consultant to comply with federal and state anti-discrimination rules and to improve the access and assistance for disabled people like me from now on. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Mayor, there are no more hands raised on this item. Okay, we thank the public comment. Uh, I'll make a motion to approve. Second. Roll call, please. Um, Council Member Hoffa. Yes. Council Member Williamson. Yes. Council Member Albert. Yes. Council Member Smith. Yes. And Mayor Roberson. And that's a yes. It passes 5 0. So that's the uh, end of our consent agenda. We'll go into our first public hearing, and that's to confirm the Alvarado Street Maintenance District and an assessment. And that would uh, require passing a resolution. Uh, again, uh, was this a. Did we follow the protest hearing? Is that the protocol we're using here or is it tonight or was it in writing? Tonight and um, we'll just this need a few we moments. Start counting the, the ballots in the box, right? That's that's correct. Yeah, okay, I thought we did that last time. So anyway, yeah. uh, Nat or Hans, you wanna explain that, that process for the public, please? Yeah, Nat, go ahead. Yes, uh, our interim public works director, Andrea Rennie, will say a few words about uh, the process and both of these assessments, two separate items. Well, welcome interim uh, public works director. First chance to speak to us in that role, right? Yes, first chance. Thank you very much, Mayor Roberson, council members, staff, and members of the public. We are here this afternoon to confirm the two assessment districts. We have the Alvarado Street Maintenance District, which was established in 1985. The Calle Principal Maintenance District established in 2000. The assessment districts were identified and put into place to offer an enhanced level of service in these areas. The property owners do pay the assessment based on their property frontage. This is a process that was set up under section 22585 of the Streets and Highways Code. 
On March 15, 2022, the City Council ordered the preparation of the engineer's report to establish the annual assessment. That report is an attachment to the agenda report. Tonight is the hearing and protest vote where property owners can protest whether they want the assessment to be upheld or not. I would like to note that Alvarado members of the district did recommend an increase of 15 cents. Uh, and the new amount is $1.63 per foot per month. For Cayo Municipal, it's still assessed at $0.74 cents per foot per month. And now we can proceed to count the ballots that were received by the city clerk's office. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Andrea. Well done. And so uh, this whole idea of a protest hearing is if over 50% of the uh, assessees protest or don't want to continue with the Alvarado Street Maintenance District, then they would prevail. That does take a pause. As I recall, we take a pause while we start counting ballots, right? Yeah, we stay in recess. Uh, we don't go into recess. Understood. So, good. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Well, how long did you plan on this uh, taking? Can I get down to Farmer's Market and go see Rick Johnson? <laughs> Rick Johnson said he'd be down there. <laughs> yeah, or, or beer goes good in that. I'd go beer. Hmm. So do we have any idea how many we received? Any how many we received? Yeah. Okay. That worked? No, I was well, yeah, technically I was I was hoping Send me the photo that you took of. Oh yeah, that's a that's a good photo. Yeah, for sure. It was a really good photo. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go see. Right. 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 Right
Yeah, I think you're a curious about the next question. There you go. All right. Uh, is Ellen online? 
Let's now, does sure. Alan online? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> all right. Hi, Alan. I see you. That doesn't count. We're talking public persona. All right. So we we finished uh, with the counting and Clementine. What did we find out? Yes, there is no protest vote, so it it passes. All right, it mm -hmm. passes. So at that point, I guess we still would require public comment. Or yes. Not? Whose voice is that? <laughs> that was mine. I'm sorry. I need to turn my camera back on. <laughs> oh, <laughs> <laughs> there I am. Sorry. <laughs> No, this this is the, these hybrid meetings are are very interesting. Let's put it that way, because you just uh, we have people here, then you have voices uh, coming from the ether, and and it's it's a lot of fun. Not that I'm saying that, that our city attorney's voice came from the ether, but I know when we say who's talking, <laughs> it's kind of fun in a way. We're just keeping up with technology, right? And so uh, any public comment with respect to there's uh, no protest, in other words, that we are confirming the maintenance district, which uh, the merchants did voluntarily. It wasn't a city imposed program, but they voluntarily assessed themselves to promote. And that's really admirable. So any public comment in here on that online? All right, then I'll entertain a motion. Second. I'll make a motion and we'll second it. <laughs> roll call, please. Uh, Councilmember Albert. Yes. Councilmember Williamson. Yes. Councilmember Hoffa. Yes. Councilmember Smith. Yes. And Mayor Roberson. Yes. All right, we will move on to Calle Principal. Well, the next public hearing is the Calle, Calle Principal Maintenance District. The other day I was watching the old 60s music, you know, Time Life does it. And yeah. Second verse, same as the first. That's uh, uh, I'm Henry the Eighth, I am. Yeah, yeah, and it goes over and over and over again. It's it was yeah. hilarious. Who was that? Herman's 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 Herman's, I think. Yeah, yeah, hilarious. So anyway, second verse, same as the first. Go for it. We'll be back. Yeah. <laughs> it's either Herman Herman's, and I think the monkeys did their own rendition too. Maybe it was the monkeys. Yeah. I don't know who did it. Two or three one. Okay. Yes. Okay. That was so funny. It was a big hit. It was the same thing. Right? Four okay. or five times. Yeah. Uh I know. But you know what? And people danced to it. Yeah, okay. sure. Yeah. They loved okay. it. And then maybe it was Ed Sullivan. Okay. Yeah. Ed, Ed Sullivan, Sullivan did, did all of the acts that Ed Sullivan had on. It was amazing. Okay. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We, I remember us watching that before your time, but probably Ed Sullivan, yeah. Five, seven, six, Stephen Colbert okay. in the Ed Sullivan okay. Theater, same theater. And mm -hmm. he does his show, The Late Show, right out yeah. of the Ed Sullivan Theater. Yeah. No, my, my parents never missed the Ed Sullivan show. Zero, zero, three. Okay. And then my okay. father would watch okay. the Jackie Gleason show. Oh, I know. The honeymoon. Just to be shocked for the shock value. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> One of these days, Alice. <laughs> oh, all right. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> three, eight, five. Uh, uh -huh. Yes. Okay. Uh, Clyde, mm -hmm. on this one, five. I'm just going to uh, zero, zero, abstain. Okay. Because yeah. I have an officer. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Five, two, five, zero, two, two. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Five, three, four, zero, zero, two. On. You'll be happy. I just, yeah. I did my renewal for my business license. Five, three, four, zero, and I did it before the deadline, so I didn't get it. The system all worked great. Was, we did. Where's he at? Your son? Sorry. Yeah. I <laughs> All the, all the the ownership, mm -hmm. the park district here. Park the park district. Uh, well, no, no, it's, it's, it's the up there somewhere. Somewhere. Yeah, they're on different screen now. But the park parks district, or not the park district, but the it's California State, State Parks. Mm -hmm. The protest said no. Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we'll follow up with that. I know. Figure out maybe I someone know. maybe someone just checked off the wrong what? box or something. It's happened before. Really? 
didn't read the didn't read the literature. Didn't read the literature. Didn't read the literature. Are we getting a hundred? We don't get a hundred percent replies. I bet. What percent do we get? And it's All right, are we finished counting? Yes, sir. All right, and what did you find out? Another non-protest vote, it was a majority yes. It was what? Majority yes. Okay, very good. All right, so we'll bring it to the, any public comment on the Calle Principal Maintenance District? And like no. anybody online? Okay, back to the council. Move approval. I'll second. I'll second. Okay, well, let Alan, uh, Council Member Allen, second it. Council Member Tyler made the motion. Comment, Mayor. Co Council Member Ed, please. And I'll uh, abstain from the vote since I have an office in the district. All right. So noted. Clementine will have uh, Council Member Ed abstaining because he has an office in the district. Roll call, please. Council Member Hoffa? Yes. Council Member Williamson? Yes. Um, Council Member Albert? Yes. And Mayor Roberson? Yes, that passes for zero, one abstention. All right, we're gonna go on to public appearance. This is the second reading. We've had uh, very extensive, interesting discussions about the whole idea of prohibiting the sale of all flavored tobacco products. And we asked the staff to come back because there were people who were interested in uh, shisha being exempted that also called hookah is that 
synonymous or is that the mechanism? Do we know? Delivery mechanism? I don't know. We'll find out. Sorry? Okay. So what we'll do is go ahead and ask our city manager to uh, bring us up to date, please, on the staff recommendation. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, we have a little bit different uh, staff recommendation. We um, will explain this to you in our presentation, and it's also outlined in our agenda report. We have prepared an um, ordinance that is reflective of what council shared with us at the last meeting, uh, but uh, we will also say uh, we are asking council to reconsider and consider uh, the recommendation of staff that we are presenting tonight as well. So with that, I'll hand it over to Brianna. Okay, welcome again, Brianna. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Hans, and thank you to Mayor Oberson and the council for the careful consideration they've given to this topic so far. Uh, so we're here to receive a second reading of a draft flavored tobacco ordinance, which proposed a ban on the sale of all flavored tobacco products, all flavored vape products, and all single-use disposable electronic smoking devices. After receiving comments from the public and from the hookah tobacco industry during the first reading, council requested that staff update the draft ordinance to include an exemption for hookah tobacco, which is presented in tonight's agenda. Uh, council also requested additional information from staff regarding hookah use, and so we will discuss those findings in this presentation. I would like to begin by emphasizing that the staff recommendation for this policy is to adapt, adopt an ordinance modifying the current tobacco retail licensing city code to ban the sale of all flavored tobacco products, including flavored shisha or tobacco, hookah tobacco. Uh, so let's first take into consideration the public health outcomes of hookah. This is still a tobacco product that contains nicotine and other carcinogenic chemicals. A typical hookah session can last between 40 minutes to an hour. And in that time, the user inhales 100 to 200 times the smoke, the amount of smoke and 1.7 times the amount of nicotine as during a cigarette smoking session. Hookah puts users at the same risk of developing cancer, heart, and respiratory diseases while also increasing their chances of blood clots and cancers in the nose and throat. It's been said that hookah contains less nicotine than cigarettes, but any small amount of nicotine is harmful to youth. It increases their chances of nicotine addiction and impedes brain development, resulting in decreased attention span and increased anxiety and irritability. These changes to the adolescent brain can be permanent. One of the primary points hookah advocates have made is the importance of hookah as a cultural tradition for Middle Eastern and South Asian populations. According to the World Health Organization, the hookah water pipe was invented in the 16th century. When it was first developed, no flavoring was added to hookah tobacco, and it was a strong and harsh smoking experience that was primarily enjoyed by men. Humari, who is one of the hookah manufacturers who provided public comment in past meetings, states on its website that flavoring wasn't added to hookah until the 19th century when molasses and honey were added to the, to, to the tobacco, demonstrating that hookah was around for at least three centuries before flavoring became part of the tradition. Most other sources don't point to flavors being added to hookah until the 1990s, when hookah users began immigrating to other parts of the world and opening hookah lounges. And it was at this point that the hookah tobacco, that the tobacco industry began to include fruity and sweet flavors to appeal to a much wider global audience. So today, hookah tobacco is most popular with young adults between the ages of 18 and 30. And mm. I'll remind you that 18 is under the legal age for smoking in California. In California, Hispanics make up the largest demographic of young adults who reported using hookah, or, or approximately 54% of hookah users. And in addition to that, many mis Middle Eastern countries have worked to restrict hookah use in recent years for public health and religious reasons, including Iran, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, and some jurisdictions in Egypt and India. It could be argued that the cultural tradition hookah retailers are trying to protect today is a chic, glamorous smoking experience that's promoted by celebrity influencers like Drake, Shaquille O'Neal, and many other celebs. Some hookah companies have even developed new hookah pipe designs like the ones shown here. These are anything but the large, bulky $200 hookah pipes that were previously described. Many of these hookah pipes are just a few inches tall, 
They can be as cheap as $15. And most importantly, they're clearly targeting youth. You can see they're disguised as everyday objects, a soda bottle or a portable coffee mug for the car. Even a hookah pen, which looks like just a slightly thicker vape system. And personally, most disturbing, a hookah pipe in the shape of an AK-47. Protecting youth is the primary driver behind this ordinance and youth are not safe from hookah tobacco. A study sponsored by the, um, the National Cancer Institute and the FDA found that around 11% of the youth who participated became susceptible to hookah use by 13 years old. And that percentage increases to over 51% just five years later when they reach age 18. Also, according to the California Student Tobacco Survey, youth susceptibility to hookah has been consistently higher than, than all other forms of tobacco, including cigarettes, since 2015 um, and up until 2019 when e-cigarettes finally surpassed that susceptibility. The same study from the California Student Tobacco Survey shows that all of flavored tobacco products used of all of the flavored tobacco products used by youth, hookah is the second most popular after e-cigarettes. Um, so it, it begs the question, what could happen to hookah utilization numbers if it's the only flavored product left on the shelves? We saw a glimpse of this when hookah use, hookah use by youth and young adults rose after the FDA banned flavored cigarettes in 2009. That trend continued as the most popular uh, flavored product until 2013 when e-cigarettes became over, over past that. So this could explain why the majority of jurisdictions have not included an exemption for hookah and their flavored tobacco ordinances. None of Monterey's neighbors with flavored tobacco ordinances continue to allow flavored shisha tobacco. And out of the 127 jurisdictions in California that have passed similar ordinances, only 13 have included a hookah exemption. So adopting this ordinance in its original form does not prevent those who smoke hookah from continuing to enjoy this aspect of their culture. It does not ban the use of flavored hookah tobacco or other types of flavored tobacco at home or in public places that allow smoking. What it does do is disrupt the access points that exist for underage youth and young adults to consume tobacco products and form lifelong nicotine habits. In light of this information, city staff recommends that the proposed ordinance to amend chapter 19 of the Monterey City Code is adopted in its original form with no exemptions for flavored shisha tobacco or any type of flavored tobacco. However, there are alternatives such as adopting the ordinance as it currently reads, uh, and other um, alterations or um, options for exempting certain businesses. Thank you. Thank you. And just as you did at our last meeting, the really appreciate the extraordinary amount of research that you did and shared with us. It's really excellent information. So thank you so much, Brianna. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, uh, council questions before we go to the public? Yep. No, don't see anyone. And Alan, question, uh, Council Member Alan, any question before we go to the public? I don't see him on our screen, so. All right, so let's go ahead and see if we have public comment. Oh, on oh, this. Can you hear me? He does have his hand raised up, oh, yes. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry, Alan, don't. Can you, not... sure, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, there you um, I just wanted to try to understand something I heard near the end of the presentation. And I think the statement was that this ordinance would not prohibit the use of hookah in all of the places in public where it or where it's legal to you to use um, cigarettes or nicotine or something like that in public. Did I understand that correct? And where are those places and where aren't those places? Can you help me understand that better? So, for example, a hookah bar presumably would not be um, a place where somebody could could smoke but they could elsewhere so they could use hookah elsewhere where, where are those places thanks okay so hans will brianna be the one to answer that for us yes uh so um smoking in in, in uh, at home is, is continued to be allowed uh, also if council should uh, follow staff recommendation and put the uh, sale of hookah uh, into the mix of the other vaping products uh what will be not touched by that will be as part of our draft ordinance that we are preparing 
uh, the existing existing hookah lounge that we have in town uh, the Indian summer. So that uh, launch will be continued to be exempt from from, from that ordinance. And, and kind of a, I guess, um, a follow up on that. Um, I was a little surprised to read in the staff report that it sounds like hookah lounges where where people smoke hookah are not age restricted, like the way a bar would be. And is that something that council could add to this or look at later is that, you know, perhaps a hookah lounge should be age restricted to people 21 and over. Is that something we could do? Because it seems like that um, in reading the report, that was the thing that I kind of found most troubling in terms of how youth could end up being introduced um, to flavored tobacco kind of indirectly by, you know, being there with someone who is 21 and then they let them use the hookah. Yes, absolutely. And um, I think we completely agree that having that age restriction should be included in a future ordinance. It was one of the options that we discussed um, while drafting the the ordinance that is in the current agenda uh, packet, uh, we, because we do have uh, testimony of, we know of someone, probably many people who have gone to hookah bars uh, under the age of 21 and have been able to partake without necessarily um, purchasing the product directly. Um, so yes, we absolutely encourage that there be an age restriction included for being able to enter the premises of a hookah lounge, which is uh, included in, in many other ordinances that exempt hookah. Okay, thank you. Good answers. Another question, Council Member Tyler, please. So I just Questions? want I just want to clarify as a follow up to Alan's question. The hookah lounge that currently exists in the city, they would be permitted to continue. Um, I guess giving out flavored hookah as part of their transactions for people that come to their business, but they can't sell. Right, it would pre this would prevent them from selling it for people to come in, set, buy it, and walk out. Is that accurate? Yes, uh, I, I think um, um, what I will often have to do is pull up the ordinance that We can't hear who's talking. I'm You're sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. That was no, I'm sorry. Um, I, I'm asking you to pull, pull up the draft ordinance uh, that shows that uh, that section that that we have just uh, discussed. And I think you have the. Is this the latest version? This is the latest version. Yes, uh, and the language includes uh, whereas clause here, stating that it is the intent of the ordinance to exempt from its application the use of. Uh, specifically 220 Olivier Street, which is the uh, address for Indian Summer, uh, where it could be purchased and used on site. And uh, the specific language, as you look at the uh, modification here, and Chrissy may uh, may want to chime in too, is that it does not apply to flavored shisha tobacco products sold at 220 Olivier Street, Monterey for on site use unless the retail sale of flavored shisha tobacco at this location is discontinued for a period of 90 consecutive days or more, at which time the sales of flavored shisha tobacco will be prohibited. Thank you for the clarification. All right, uh, excellent answers, always on your toes. So let's go ahead and open up public comment for people who go to our council meeting. Well, we'd like to hear from you. Thank Hello. You so much, Mr. Mayor, members of the council and staff. My name is Kendra Howell. I'm a senior policy lead with the Blue Zones Project, Monterey County, and also an employee of Salinas Valley Memorial Health Care System. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for the wonderful report and for this great discussion tonight. Um, I'm just here to urge the council to consider the TRL amendment without the exception for flavored shisha, a tobacco product by definition. 
an exemption for flavored shisha, shisha, shisha sales mm -hmm. would allow those products to be sold in any retailers currently selling tobacco, yet those same businesses would not be allowed to sell all of the other flavored tobacco products not included in the exemption. This is confusing and defeats the purpose of the ordinance, which is to significantly reduce the appeal, availability, and usage of nicotine for youth and young adults. Public health and medical data proves that smoke is smoke, regardless of how it's consumed and in what form. Flavored tobacco products, including shisha, contain harmful chemicals that create nicotine addiction and cause adverse health effects. Many advocates talk about the social activity around smoking, hookah, the negative health effects of any tobacco product makes no distinction between smoking in a group as a social activity and smoking alone. And to put that into context, Blue Zones partners with Sun Street Centers and their Steps Youth for park cleanups and beach cleanups. The biggest area where we find the most um, tobacco litter is around basketball courts and of course, picnic and barbecue areas. Right. And in fact, in one of the parks, the youth collected over 1,500 pieces of tobacco litter in one afternoon. Wow. I think you could say, well, they're, they're socially, they're doing something socially together. Yet I believe none of us would say that that's a, a social activity we would promote to our friends, our family, and certainly our youth. The cultural tradition of hookah is pure tobacco. It's not flavored. That's not as appealing. So the industry created flavors to do one thing, to sell more product by attracting more users. These flavored products are no different than the vape and tobacco products we all agree are dangerous to the community. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Other uh, folks here would like to comment in the council chambers? If anyone else wants to speak, we encourage you to move forward. You know, we're getting close to our adjournment time. Welcome. Hi, I'm Eloise Shim. So um, I wanted to comment that a business that's able to provide the shisha may adopt traditional flavored tobacco products and provide them to the public. So uh, because it's so confusing and there's such a fine line to what is the shisha and the flavored and so on, you know, they might just be liberal about providing the other traditional flavored products at their establishment. And if I could make one comment about um, that you passed about 15, since it's a smoking cannabis thing, can I talk about it even though you passed it a little bit? Um, what are you talking about consent item 15? Yeah. No, I'm sorry, your time for that has passed. And But uh, okay. oh, would you write us though, please? Let it, just email us and we'll read it. All right. Yeah. Okay, thank you for your comments, Eloise. Uh, anyone, uh, no one else uh, online? Yes, we do have quite a few online. And we do have uh, 10, over 10 hands raised. So uh, if the mayor would like, we could do a two minute or, or three if you would prefer. Well, we can continue this at seven, which is awkward for the public sometimes. Hammer through. I, you, I'm, I'm fine to continue. Shall we continue? Yeah. Is it two minute um, limit? I think that makes sense. Otherwise, we're here at 6 30. I've been through that one. Never do that again. So, we're going to limit people to uh, two minutes. And that, that's not to preclude public comment. It's a question of the council needs to get topic in. Uh, we probably wouldn't otherwise. This is the limit of we're having a hard time hearing you, Mr. Mayor. All right. I don't know. Yeah. So if I had it up here, Clementine, uh, when you looked at it in Zoom, it looked like I had a big dip in the middle of my forehead, so I moved it down here. <laughs> All right, we're going to do two minutes. Let's go um, online. They've been a folk. Have spoken before. We heard you, and you don't necessarily make even to use the two minutes. All right, so first, let's hear from Amaya Wooding. Please go ahead. 
<clears throat> Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Amaya Wooding. Thank you, city staff, for the presentation and council for your consideration of this item. I'm concerned about the following whereas in the draft ordinance. Whereas it has been determined that the use of flavored shisha tobacco or hookah should be preserved as a cultural activity and has less impact on youth nicotine addiction than other flavored tobacco products. That's attributed to the California Student Tobacco Survey or CSTS, but that's not what CSTS shows. It shows that the percentage of youth using hookah is lower than, say, vapes, but comparable to other products that are not exempted, such as large cigars and smokeless tobacco. It also shows that over 80% of high school hookah users in California prefer flavored hookah. Nowhere does it say that the tobacco in hookah is somehow less addictive, which it would be false to imply. To paraphrase the mayor of Arinda, another California city which recently did not exempt hookah from a thorough flavored tobacco policy, cancer does not care whether your product is traditional. Going out of your way to exempt it for one retailer alone sends a message that it is somehow deserving of special treatment. I think um, in preparing for this comment, I found the same World Health Organization document uh, as city staff, which says, quote, the introduction of sweetened flavored water pipe tobacco, commonly called ma'asal, in the 1990s appears temporally related to the surge of popularity in water pipe smoking. Previously to also, water pipe smokers use raw tobacco in their pipes. That is, flavored hookah has been around for 30 years and is hardly traditional. Hookah use poses similar risks to youth as other tobacco products. Young adults who have never used hookah, oh, excuse me, who have ever used hookah are more likely to go on to try cigarettes and marijuana, which is also a pattern we see for those who try vaping. The reality is that flavored nicotine products of any kind are addictive regardless of source, so exempting hookah that's flavored on the basis of bad research and ahistorical claims is simply not warranted. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Next, let's hear from Thomas Lawton. Go ahead, please. Good evening, Honorable Mayor and Council Members. My name is Thomas Lawton. I'm the Government Affairs Representative for Hookah Manufacturer from Mari, as well as a member of the National Hookah Community Association. On behalf of the proud members of the NHCA Monterey, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak tonight on Agenda Item 20. We express our gratitude for taking the time to learn about the cultural practice of hookah and show our support for taking action against the youth nicotine addiction epidemic and agree that youth should not have access to tobacco. Although when considering this flavored tobacco ban, please take the time to understand the service Indian Summers Hookah Lounge provides for the Middle Eastern and Southeast Asian communities in Monterey, the only hookah lounge these community members are able to enjoy. We kindly ask that you continue to protect the cultural identity of the minority communities that practice hookah, just as statewide flavored tobacco ban California Senate Bill 793 does. I remind the mayor and council that part of the reason we're here today is because too often hookah has become collateral damage on the war against vape. Hookah tobacco since its inception over 500 years ago is flavored. Hookah tobacco has been mixed with molasses or honey to preserve the tobacco and is what gives it a sweet flavor. Therefore, because of this reason, all hookah tobacco is inherently flavored. The NHCA is unaware of unflavored hookah tobacco sold in the United States. We're also here this evening for the respectable and important mission to prevent our youth from nicotine addiction, which the NHCA is highly supportive of. Although in pursuit of this noble goal, I ask the mayor and council to not disregard the facts reported by credible organizations. I remind us today that there are no studies that support hookah as being used by our youth. In fact, studies cited by tobacco-free kids and reported by the FDA and CDC all show that hookah use amongst our youth is neg negligible, less than 1%. Therefore, with each of these studies stating that youth are not using hookah, it becomes clear that failing to exempt hookah would only serve to blatantly discriminate against Middle Eastern and Southeast Asian cultures. Thank you for your time. Wow, that's loud. Sorry about that. <laughs> they took away. They took away the old timer we used to use, and so I'm trying this one. Sorry, everyone. Um, flashback with all my fifth graders. Boom! <laughs> they're out the door. <laughs> School's out. <laughs> Next, we have Tim Gibbs. <laughs> Tim Gibbs, go ahead, please. Yeah, hi, my name is Tim Gibbs, and I'm with the Campaign for Tobacco Free Kids. And I wanted to thank the council for, for all the hard work on this issue and specifically prohibiting the sale of all flavored tobacco products. Um, I also wanted to commend uh, staff for the uh, well-researched um, report on flavored shisha products. So uh, keeping it short, I would urge the council to um, <clears throat> so, uh, 
support the uh, prohibition on the sale of all flavored tobacco products and to make sure there is no exemption for flavored shisha products. Thank you. Thanks for your comment. Next, we have Jaina Kay. Hi, uh, this is Jaina Kirsch. Uh, I'm representing the Summer Hookah Lounge. Good evening. Um, I would like to say that we um, are with definitely not condoning any youth using tobacco products of any kind. And as a responsible lounge uh, of 21 and over, and we don't allow anybody in here under 21 at any point in time, um, that we would not be, that the hookah would not be a uh, part of the youth epidemic of, of tobacco use. Um, also, uh, we don't advertise or glamorize to the public whatsoever. Uh, we are strictly word of mouth uh, lounge. Um, and I definitely agree with, uh, you know, keeping the youth out and, and, but I do agree that adults should be able to enjoy what they want, you know, when they want and that the ban shouldn't be uh, set forth. Um, and especially for us being responsible and not having um, any type of underage um, use in our lounge whatsoever. Uh, so Are you still with us? Hello. Hello, are you? I guess I cut, I guess I cut out. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, you did a little bit, yeah. Yeah. So you so, want to wrap it up for us, please? So, uh, yeah, what I'd just like to say, again, we, we are against serving youth. Uh, we are strictly adults only, 21 and over. And I believe that as a responsible lounge, we should be exempt from uh, serving to the public under our supervision, uh, Tisha, and being able for adults to enjoy. Uh, our service. Thank you. That's been the ordinance, but you asked, right? All right. And uh, next we have Jen Grand uh, Lejano. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, my name is Jen Graham Lahano with American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network. I'm the government relations director for Northern California and I specialize in local flavored tobacco policy. So I wanna thank you for considering a tobacco retailer license um, to protect the health of our youth by ending the sale of most flavored tobacco products. Um, however, the current ordinance exempts the sale of flavored shisha products which is very much against best practice. So we would urge you to strike that exemption for flavored shisha so that this TRL would end the sale of all products without any exemption for any store flavor um, or, or flavored tobacco product and protect youth and communities of color from big tobacco targeting. Um, it's imperative to include all flavored products and not leave a loophole that the tobacco industry could then exploit, um, leaving flavored tobacco products in the community. Uh, as the staff uh, mentioned, uh, it begs the question, what would happen to these hookah rates if it's the only flavored nicotine tobacco product that's available to them? Um, a flavored shisha is on the rise among youth. Uh, of, among ind individuals who were not current smokers, those who had tried hookah were more likely to report and tend to try cigarettes soon. And more than one in five high school students in a, one study first learned about flavored shisha by seeing a hookah bar in their community. A common misperception is that hookah is somehow less harmful than other tobacco products, which is simply not true as you've seen in your staff report. Um, it's important to note that this is a sales restriction, not a use restriction. So those who wish to use hookah in their homes can continue to do so and buy any flavored product that they would like online. But youth who predominantly get their tobacco illegally from brick and mortar stores will be protected by not having any flavored product marketed to them. Um, so the hookah exemption before you is incredibly broad and weaker than what the, um, what the state passed which is now Prop 31 to be voted on in the November state election. Um, again, we don't wanna see any loopholes like this and uh, leave our, vulner our youth vulnerable to addiction and disease. So we urge you to 
Mm -hmm. um, strike the exemption and make this policy as strong as what your neighbors have passed. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Thank you. And um, Jimmy and Sierra. Go ahead, please. Good evening, City Council Member and Mayor. Uh, my name is Jimmy Ansara. Uh, while addressing flavors, it's important to address all flavored hookah products, including tobacco, or, or including hookah. Hookah, which has many of the same other risks as other tobacco products. According to the California Student Tobacco Survey, 82.5% of California high schoolers who use hookah prefer a flavored product. Young people who use hookah are more likely to try it later to try vapes, cigarettes, and marijuana. I wanna share with you why hookah matters and how hookah is a gateway into other tobacco products. I grew up in a city where you could find multiple hookah lounges open on, on any given night. In my friend's group, visiting a hookah lounge was one of the first places you went to celebrate your 18th birthday. It was a rite of passage. It was something you looked forward to because you were able to choose the flavor for the night. I remember being overwhelmed by the extensive list, list of flavors offered like pineapple mango, mojita, white Russian. They also had options to add juice or alcohol to your flavor and move the water, something similar to the one in, <clears throat> in Monterey does. Doesn't sound very traditional to me. One night shortly after I had my rite of passage into the hookah lounges, I also smoked my first cigarette. I was walking home with a hookah buddy one evening and he lit up a cigarette and then turned to offer me one. I was caught off guard since I never smoked a cigarette before, nor did I even consider myself a smoker. I just went to the hookah lounges for the social aspect. So when looking back at that moment, I remember my thought process being smoking is smoking, so why wouldn't I? After a few seconds of hesitation, I finally accepted his cigarette and an invitation to addiction. There was no doubt in my mind that my habitual hookah use directly influenced my smoking a cigarette that evening. After that night, I became a regular smoker and I can confidently say that hookah was the gateway to my year-long nicotine dependence. As a Latin gay male, I have witnessed firsthand how flavored hookah hooks vulnerable youth and leads them to use other type of tobacco products. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And next we have Sheila Fan. Sheila, go ahead, please. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Robertson and City Council members. My name is Sheila Fan, and I am here on behalf of Breathe California, an organization that fights various lung diseases in all of its forms and promotes lung health through advocacy and education. I'm here today because I very much so want to applaud the city of Monterey for bringing forth an ordinance to ban the sale of flavored tobacco. This ordinance will protect the people of Monterey from the physical and mental burdens of tobacco addiction and nicotine addiction, a disorder that I see so often among my peers, as well as individuals that I help through our quit smoking program. However, mean, we must not pass an ordinance with a hookah exemption. An exemption of hookah perpetuates deeply rooted health inequities by failing to address public health concerns of the communities that disproportionately use these products. Again, according to the CDC, studies have shown that hookah smoke contains many of the same components of cigarette smoke, such as nicotine, tar, and heavy metals. In addition, people who smoke hookah or shisha absorb more toxic substances compared to individuals that smoke cigarettes due to the prolonged exposure of secondhand, secondhand and thirdhand smoke. I encourage you to the to adopt the ordinance in its original form prior to this reading to ban the sale of all flavored tobacco products, single use electronic smoking devices and hookah in the city of Monterey to protect the health and well being of Monterey residents. Thank you so much for your time and dedication to this issue. Thank you and next we have Rima Khoury. Go ahead, please. Good afternoon, Mayor and City Council members. Um, thank you for your time tonight. Um, I just want to address um, some of the points made in the staff report and some inaccuracies. I mean, first off, we can all agree smoking is bad, just like according to the CDC, um, underage drinking is at 24.6% nationally and 37% national for marijuana. So here we're talking about uh, shisha or hookah, which is less than 1% nationally used by youth. So, you know, as mentioned, you know, hookah has been around since the 16th century. Uh, so for hundreds of years, it's been used primarily in the Middle East. 
If you look on the World Health Organization website, you'll see that cancer rates in those Middle Eastern countries are the lowest in the world. So how is that? Uh, it was also stated that um, a smoking session of hookah is the equivalent to 100 or 200 cigarettes. Just think about that. I mean, I would drop dead if I smoked 200 cigarettes in one session. It's just counterintuitive. Um, they said that, so hookah tobacco has been traditionally flavored with honey and molasses. It's called masal for hundreds of years. Uh, someone, I think Ms. Brianna had mentioned that on the Fumari website, it said that, that flavors were introduced in the 90s. That is not accurate. Um, so it's been made with honey, molasses, dried apples, and has been for centuries. Uh, there is a, 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 another type of tobacco called ajame, which is non-flavored that is not used uh, in the United States. So traditional hookahs are three feet tall. You probably could find many variations of that. They're adulterated. This is what we're trying to protect Protect is traditional hookah. She, I think it was also introduced that there's a hookah pen. Don't be mistaken. That's a vape being called something else. Um, according to the California Youth Survey, uh, the California Youth Use Hookah is less than percent It's at 0.6%. So much lower than the national average. Um, and, and just tell okay, me. Thank you. Next, we have Michelle House. Michelle, please go ahead. Yes, hi, good evening, Mayor, City Council, Michelle House, Monterey County Health Department. I serve as a supervisor in the Chronic Disease and Injury Prevention Branch. I just want to remind everyone this evening that the county earlier this year banned all flavored tobacco products. Our ban is a complete flavored ban. We do not have an exemption. And then I just want to continue to offer um, anytime you need education for the community, any way we can assist, we are here to help in onboarding the educational efforts to the existing tobacco retailers within the city of Monterey. Thank you for your time this evening. Thank you. And next we have George Johnson. George, please go ahead. Good evening, Monterey. My name is George Johnson. I'm a member of the National Hookah Community Association. And I am a manufacturer of traditional wooden hookah pipes called Regal Hookah. What was said earlier by the staff report and by some callers in is completely inaccurate. You can find double apple flavor. Nakla Ibiliari uh, tobacco manufacturing has existed for over 110 years and they're still in business selling double apple. Uh, it's a very traditional flavor. And like said, like some other callers have said, with the introduction of molasses and honey into tobacco, has been almost 500 years. You can find the ghoul and uh, jurak in the Middle East that that has that. So there's, there seems to be a large bunch of blaring, you know, inaccuracies, including the 82% youth tobacco survey saying that they prefer a flavored tobacco, uh, flavored shisha. Of course they do because that's all that exists. So there there is no unflavored market in the U.S. Nobody's buying. You know, the, these things, as well as some of the studies that say 100 cigarettes is, is equal to one hour of hookah. Uh, if you read some of those studies, they're crushing up cigarette tobacco and putting charcoal directly on top of it. Um, you know, if hookah was being used at the same rate as, as you know, the youth had, had been picking up Juul, I would be marching to end my own business and to end the support of any hookah products whatsoever. 100%. But that's just not what the data shows. It's not where logic shows. You know, this, this person who has a hookah lounge in Monterey has a legal business that was, illegal, was legal today and could potentially lose everything. They could lose their, their income. They could be, you know, they, they could be personal guarantors on their lease and have to file a bankruptcy because they're, they're stuck within this lease. You know, there's a lot of things to consider when we're not the problem. And, and so Monterey made the right choice in exempting hookah. Other municipalities have done so. San Jose, San Diego, Irvine, Los Angeles. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you. And next we have Ann Wheelis. Ann, please go ahead. Thank you. Good evening, honorable mayor and city council members. I am Ann Wheelis and I'm a member of the California State Advocacy Committee of the American Heart Association and a retired health educator. 
the American Heart Association does not support the proposed exemptions for flavored shisha tobacco products and electronic hookahs. The assumption that hookah is an ancient communal event primarily enjoyed by specific ethnic and cultural groups is no longer true. The 2018 California Health of Inter Interview Survey found that hookah is primarily used by adults 18 to 29 years of age, and the Hispanic Latino population makes up over 50% of the young adult users. In addition to the large communal use hookah pipes, small handheld electronic hookahs are inexpensive and available for sale. These products make it easy for youth to experiment with the smoking without having to find a lounge or some other uh, communal organization in which to participate. The Journal of the American Medical Association study found that in the United States, nearly 80% of youth hookah users reported using hookah because it came in flavors they like. And as you've heard, the 2017-18 California Student Tobacco Survey found that among high school students who are current hookah users, almost 90% use flavored hookah. Um, I'd like to just comment that granting an exemption for current lounges in Monterey County, if they do not have a legal requirement to limit their services to those under age 21, might create an enforcement problem that would need to be dealt with. Finally, the American Heart Association does not support the proposed exemptions removing shisha and electronic hookahs. We uh, encourage you to affirm the good work of your staff and pass the original proposed ordinance without these exemptions. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and next we have Neve. Neve, go ahead, please. Good evening, City Council. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, I would first like to say electronic hookahs do not exist. Those are vapes. Hookah does not use electricity. Um, secondly, the use of um, hookahs amongst 18 year olds, those statistics were before um, the smoking age was 18, before T-21 uh, T passed at the end of 2019. So those are old statistics. We need to be using the newest data and that is saying that hookah is not the issue here. We need to focus on vaping. We need to exempt Tuka. I find it so heartbreaking that we are sitting here discussing taking out this poor lounge that is legally opened in our city and going to say, hey, you know what? We're going to have to shut you down. How is that fair when this issue started because of vaping? Tuka is not the issue. By banning the sale of shisha tobacco in this city, this lounge wouldn't be able to operate as it is today. So I would like to thank you for considering to exempt hookah from the slaver ban. And thank you to those two speakers for clearing up all the misinformation these paid advocates are trying to use to push their agenda. I've seen so many of these city council meetings where these people come in and they were focusing on vapes in the beginning, but now that they see that vapes are being banned easily, they're attacking hookah when hookah was never the issue. More than 13 towns have exempted hookah, including the whole state of California. So please take all of this into consideration and please listen to the facts and please save this business. I wouldn't even know where to begin if you're gonna just take out a business like that. So please thank you for your for exempting hookah. Thank you. Thank you. And next we have Brian McCarthy. Brian, go ahead, please. Hi, good evening. First, uh, thank you for considering this and thank you to your staff for such an in-depth presentation with fact-based evidence as to why they are recommending not exempting hookah. The report is impressive and demonstrates a high level of competence. I'll try and not uh, be repetitive on the facts since you've heard so many already. I'm glad to see the regional work being done on this. I can tell you I am personally working on a similar ordinance for Marina. So rest assured as residents of Marina, we're watching closely and looking forward to following your leadership. I urge you not to exempt flavored hookah from this ordinance. Although I do appreciate the concern for existing businesses by some kind of grandfathering provision, I have to tell you that according to web reviews, the establishments you want to exempt are offering flavors such as birthday cake, gummy bear, and fruity pebbles, which are not traditional. So I'd really encourage you to consider what population that is likely to affect. I think an alternative would be to help these businesses pivot and succeed in healthier ways instead of making an exemption. The terms cultural, traditional, religious, and Middle Eastern are used to solicit positive feelings towards hookah. However, I'll offer the following perspectives. 
The interesting thing about cultural and traditional aspects of tobacco, which is what you're looking at tonight, is that it's actually unflavored cigarettes that has strong traditions. Unflavored traditional tobacco that's been used by Native Americans and Alaskans uh, for ceremonial and me medicinal uses. So I'd encourage, yourself, encourage you to ask yourself, if making an exemption for hookah, why regulate tobacco at all? Um, so therefore, I suggest HUCA has no unique legitimate basis for special exemption from your ordinance under cultural concerns. Um, you've heard a lot of other facts that I won't repeat, um, but I, the World Health Organization does mention that water pipe users or HUCA users tend to be younger and more affluent, and empirical and anecdotal evidence pretends future increases in prevalence, especially as HUCA cafes proliferate. Um, so again, encourage you not to exempt. I appreciate the time and, um, you know, the rest of the region continues to watch. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, thank you. And next we have Katya. Go ahead, please, Katya. Hello. Um, thank you for allow giving me the floor and allowing me to speak. My name is Katia, and I'm Program Manager for Prevention Services and Sensory Centers. Um, I would just like to talk on behalf of some of my cases that I have. I have had youth let me know that um, a certain business in Monterey has been easily accessible. Um, and I'll also like to put um, emphasize on the fact that we've also had um, comments uh, said to us about how 18-year-olds have been able to access the hookah lounge. And um, I completely agree that those flavors of birthday cake, you know, fruity pebbles, those are not um, uh, cultural flavors. And so if we're making that argument, it's a little bit contradictory for the people that are for it, because some people are saying, you know, oh, the, the culture and the history and other people are saying, you know, well, this is the business it's going to go out of business. So to me, everybody's contradicting each other. So what is it? Are you worried about the culture? Or are you worried about the place going out of business? Um, I have worked with youth for many, 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 many years, and this has been an ongoing issue. Um, so I, I really suggest that, you know, um, the council take it into consideration of not exempting um, uh, hookah. Um, and then another uh, another thing too is that we all know that the Western world has little knowledge of the cultural of hookah. So in realist, rea in reality, the people who are attending these lounges are are not going because of the culture. They're going because they want to go um, and smoke. So to me, if they're going to go because they want to go smoke, what's the issue with not having with with not having flavors? Because they're going to go regardless. This business also has um, a, a bar in there, and so they also have that side of the business as well. Um, thank you very much. And Mr. Mayor, that was the last speaker, so uh, we have no more public comments. All right, I'll close public comment then. Back to the council. I'd like to adjourn in about four minutes. Are, are we ready to make a motion and move on it, or shall we continue? I'll move the staff recommendation. I'll second the current one, uh, which means uh, hookah will not be exempt. Yes, uh, correct. But it would, but it would grandfather in the existing business yes, for can only on-site use. Please, please. Yeah, we saw. Okay. Yeah. yeah, and we wanted to make a comment, Tyler. Well, I, and I, I was just going to highlight that exact point. I think there was a couple of comments where it seemed there was not clarity in regards to what the ordinance was stating. So I just wanted to clarify that. And then just one last additional point. Uh, you know, being on the council and and highlighting that issue of um of tradition and and cultural respect i i think that it was really important for us to engage in a little bit of a deeper conversation and i just really appreciate staff's um willingness to do a little bit more research here and it was a beautiful report so i really appreciate the additional deep dive and for the council to take a little bit more time to consider this but i agree with staff's recommendation and that's why i'm supporting them uh the motion today any other Comments? Yeah, I just have one comment. Yes, please. Um, I'd like to thank the staff personally for um, giving us the information that I think I needed to make my decision. You know, as a, a past educator and athletic coach, uh, my job is to keep healthy lifestyles amongst the youth. And and it's obvious, very obvious to me that teens and adults, uh, young adults gravitate to um, flavored tobacco. And that's why for me, I, I think it's so important that we keep it out of out of range for any any use. And that's why I think that recommendation is, is uh, I'm just happy that the, the staff came back with that. Thank you very much. 
Um, so I, I, I appreciate the staff's uh, relook at this, but I must admit, I, I don't want to rush this and, and I, and I want to be able to go through this document, but we're only seeing it what's on screen. So I have several questions for the attorney. Would the mayor consider uh, continuing this to seven o'clock? Absolutely. Okay. All right. um, because I want to make sure I get a chance to go through this new document that's in front of us. I have some uh, questions for the attorney, and I want to make sure that this we are making comprehensive law and comprehensive decisions that are accurate. All right. So what we will do that we will take a recess and we will pick this up as the first item this evening. Thank you. All right. We'll see everybody at seven o'clock. <laughs> Thank you. And we will not be reopening public comment.
Recording in progress. All right, welcome back everybody to our council meeting. And bef uh, before we call the meeting to order, as always, we want to share with people how they can participate in our meeting. And I think people are getting to be pretty professional with that. So without further ado, we will ask our prestigious city clerk to read, uh, to share how you can participate. Sure, so in order to safely attend our public meeting, masks are strongly recommended for those who attend in the chamber in person, regardless of vaccination status, except those who are younger than two or have a medical condition that prevents wearing a mask. Please keep your phones and devices muted in the chamber to prevent audio interference. And there are two ways to virtually participate in today's meeting. You may join us using the Zoom app on your computer or mobile device, and you can also call into the Zoom meeting. To join the meeting on Zoom on your computer, smartphone, or telephone, use the link or phone number on the agenda at iSearchMonterey.org. An up-to-date version of Zoom software must be used. To call in by telephone, dial toll-free 833-568-8864, then enter meeting ID 160-772-9333, pound, and if prompted to enter participant ID, press pound. Detailed instructions on using and updating Zoom are available at monterey.org slash public meetings. To make a comment using the Zoom app, you can virtually raise your hand by pressing the raise hand button at the bottom of your screen. If you're dialed in by phone, raise your hand by dialing star nine and unmute yourself when called upon by dialing star six. You must do both. The public commenters on Zoom will be muted until it is their turn to speak. We'll call on each public speaker in the order of their hands raised. Please stay within the time limit established for today's meeting and a countdown timer will be shown on the screen. If you're connected live on Zoom, the timer is accurate with no delay. Today's meeting is also streamed live on the city's YouTube account at youtube.com slash city of Monterey with about 10 seconds delay and on Comcast channel 25 up to 90 seconds delay. And we look forward to receiving public comment. Very good. And would you please introduce your caring city council? With pleasure, city uh, council member Albert. Here. Council member Hoffa. You're, on, you're, you're good, Alan, go ahead. Council member Smith. <laughs> Was Council that Smith? Smith? Yes. Here. Council member Williamson. Here. And Mayor Roberson. And I'm here as well. We have three of our council members in the chambers and two of us online. And one more thing, please, Clementine, would you please show the flag and we will do the Pledge of Allegiance in a moment. Absolutely. All right, good. If uh, stand as you are able and please join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. All right. Thank you everyone. And so uh, before we get into our delineated items on our evening agenda, we do have a little bit of carryover from this evening. But before we do that, let's go ahead and, and do the uh, continued public comments. Then we'll go ahead and pick up uh, where we left off with the ordinance with respect to uh, banning uh, flavor tobacco. So. Public comments would be for anyone who would like to speak anything not on the agenda. And we'll up to three minutes and please within the jurisdiction of the city of Monterey. And if you will leave a contact either now or just uh, email at suggest at monterey.org, we guarantee uh, a very able staff member will get back to you. So continue public comments not on the agenda, please. Is there anyone in the council chambers? No, Mr. Mayor. No one, I'm sorry, Nat. I'm sorry, uh, no, Mr. Mayor. Do we have attendees in the council chamber, by the way? Yeah. Uh, yes, we do. Okay, good to know. Don't want to ever leave anybody out. All right, do we have anyone online who wants to share a, a public comment? Yes, we do. Um, let's hear from John Rico Carr. And please go ahead. 
Hello, City Council. Why is it when I came to Monterey opening a not-for-profit cooperative, I was harassed, persecuted, and ultimately deprived of my right to procedural due process? Why was I not allowed my right to, to why was I not allowed my right to appeal when I filed all necessary paperwork to have my appeal heard? Why is it the cannabis laboratory was allowed to have its appeal heard during a moratorium? Well, my appeal to the Planning Commission has not only gone unheard, but was disposed of without notice and without refund of my filing fees. Why has the city shown a bias against me, a mixed race African American, versus its treatment of wealthy white entrepreneurs in the same and similar way? There is a serious injustice here. No one should have to suffer as I have since the city violated government codes. The city should know that after causing the financial hardship and damage to the professional reputation of my caregiver and I, it will be nearly impossible to reopen. The startup expenses for a dispensary today are in the millions, which we would have been able to handle if not for the city's violation and negligence. I'm left with little option, but I plan to continue my pursuit for justice. No city should be allowed to treat someone as I've been treated and no city should be able to treat people as Monterey has treated its medical cannabis community. Any previous members of My Caregiver Cooperative are urged to contact us at info at mycaregivercoop.org and um, the city can do the same. Thank you for your time. Mr. Mayor, there are no further hands raised. All right, thank you. All right, uh, let's go back then on item 20, uh, we left off, uh, we had closed public comment and this was the second reading with respect to amending the city code to prohibit the sale of all flavored tobacco products, including flavored shisha tobacco products. Originally, there was some thought about exempting them However, they now are included in the prohibition according to a motion that we had made just before our break and we wanted a little more discussion. I'm gonna ask Clementine to, uh, and maybe staff help us. The, the motion basically said what I just said is to prohibit the sale of all flavored tobacco products with no exceptions. And so there was some, was there some confusion about the staff had written a, a, an addendum or some additional information. Could you help me with that so I know it's included, please? Yeah, Mr. Mayor, if you'd like, I can share the screen. Yes, please. Okay. One moment, uh, pulling this up. And uh, this draft ordinance uh, would prohibit the sale of all flavored tobacco products except for uh let's see here i'll just i'll just show you share you the red lined areas yeah we would need to change that title too yeah. sorry about that <laughs> yeah, that's okay. well, inaccurate. yeah the, the title we would change uh otherwise this section uh this whereas would be removed we have here under this preamble of the uh intent of this ordinance to exempt from its application the use of real property located at 220 Olivier Street, Monterey. This is where Indian Summer is located as a location where flavored shisha tobacco products may be purchased and used on site. I, I don't know if you want me to read the entire uh, yeah, Go ahead while you're going, sure. Yeah. This location has sold flavored shisha tobacco products for use at its on-site hookah lounge continuously since approximately 2007. Should this use discontinue for 90 days, it is the intent of this ordinance that the sale of flavored shisha tobacco products will be prohibited throughout the city. And then as we scroll down further, under this section, it would read that subsection E does not apply to flavored shisha tobacco products sold at 220 Olivier Street, Monterey for on-site use, unless the retail sale of flavored shisha tobacco at this location is discontinued for a period of 90 consecutive days or more, at which time the sales of flavored shisha tobacco will be prohibited. All right, so uh, the maker of the motion is, is that uh, 
I think that was uh, Council Member Allen. Is that has you understood your motion to include? We are not hearing uh, Council Member Hoffa's audio for some reason. So it is a ban. Can you hear me now? We can hear yes. you now. So it is a ban on shisha tobacco um, with only essentially grandfathering in on-site use at this one particular location and only so long as that use continues there essentially um so yes that was my motion okay and the second i believe was council member tyler and is that your second apply to that motion that alan just uh, explained yes it does mayor okay thank you all right, then before we recess, I know Council Member Ed had some questions that he wanted to explore. So I'll open the floor to Council Member Ed. Yeah, great. Thank you. I, I wanted to make sure we all had a chance to go through the amended uh, whereas document that's just been shown to us. Uh, as it's already been noted by um, staff, the uh, title and description will have to change to reflect the accuracy because it's it's no longer accurate to uh, this document in the motion. Um, I, wanted, I wanted to make sure we all understood what was before us uh, because this is a carve out because there is one existing hookah lounge that would be impacted. Um, under the, the second section where it's redlined, uh, it is section 19-113 violations, subsection E, one in parentheses, small e, does not apply to flavored shisha tobacco products sold at this location. The way it's written, it took a, a little bit of concentration before dinner, which is sometimes a challenge for me, <laughs> to totally comprehend what this means. So I wanted to make sure everyone understood this because it's an important element of this. It means that this one location will continue to operate as it is now, but it will be on site sale only for their activities. It is a bar. So as I understand it, they must be 21 to serve anyone for anything in that location. But this states uh, at this location is discontinued for a period of 90 consecutive days or more, at which time the sales of flavored shisha tobacco will be prohibited. So that means if they were to cease operations for some unforeseen reason, for any more period of a 90 day, they could not reopen and pick up the sale, they would be precluded and the ordinance would then apply to them. Um, now, I'm coming to a question for Chrissy. Under section 10, it talks about the potential impacts of the state law or any future federal law. So uh, Chrissy, if you would bring to light the impacts of what would happen if legislation changes, and I understand that there's a, a ballot that's qualified and there will be um, a ballot measure in November. Could you explain the, the impact of that to the particular carve out we're talking about here? so that we can be real clear on this. Sure, so Senate Bill 793 um, was signed into law by the governor and that prohibits flavored tobacco. It does have an exemption for hookah shisha flavored tobacco products um, with some regulations such as the requirement that individuals only 21 and over enter the premises. That um, Senate bill, that law is subject to referendum at this time. And so the, the public will vote on that at the November election. If the referendum uh, passes, then our the city of Monterey's ordinance is in full force and effect and would be the rules applicable in our town. If the referendum fails, then our ordinance will apply where it is more restrictive than the state law. And where the state is more restrictive, its rules would apply. Okay, so we may be looking at this again um, in December after that election is certified, and we'll have clarity in terms of 
possibly more regulation that would impact this site or falls to purely the city's guidelines right or ordinance yes okay. um so the the other area i wanted to pose a, a question is um because it, it doesn't really address this but the potential conflicts were we to say an outright ban um and I understand we've got a business here that's been operating since 2007. Uh, they've certainly got some investment and they certainly have a, a lease. And um, right now, if this passes tonight, what are they no longer able to do? I understand what they would be able to do, but what can they no longer do as a result of this? So when this ordinance goes into effect, it has a 180 day sort of delay um, to allow retailers to offload their product um, and to adjust their business plan accordingly. So this actually wouldn't go into effect until February 14th of 2023. At that time, retail sales will cease throughout the city. The only exception will be at this one establishment, they can sell only for consumption on site. There won't be any to-go retail sales um, from this location. They'll be just like any other retail sale location, like a gas station or something, um, subject to the same rules for um, no carry out. <laughs> okay. Uh, and the location of it is kind of a unique, um, off of a street, uh, there's street parking, but it's uh, basically a walking, it's behind a large hotel. Um, is this property possibly owned by the state? Yeah. And it's and it's 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 owned by the state? No, it's not. But it's not it's not owned by the state. It's I know it's a historical building. But it's not owned by the state. Okay, thank you. Um and, and I want to yield to the other council members if they have any specific questions, but I just wanted to go through the uh, the details of this, because it's different, it's it's not an outright ban, it's for a purpose to deliver a carve out so that it does not create conflicts and does not adversely impact this location. Um, and it's the only location we have in the city of Monterey that operates under this condition. So Chrissy, the last and staff, the last question I have is, what mechanism do we have to be able to regulate what we act on tonight via ordinance to attach some uh, control to the operation and the use permit of that location? So what's the mechanism that we use to make sure that this is codified and the operators understand it? So the only use permit at that establishment right now is for live entertainment. There is no um, no other use permit on that property because the use is predated any requirement for retail or restaurant use use permits. Um, and I should also state we put in the, in the whereas clauses that the sale of hookah, shisha, tobacco has been in effect there since 2007. But I also understand that it might have been in effect there since the 80s potentially. From the prior owner i don't have the exact factual information on that but it's it's been for some period of time um and so it would be enforced like our other ordinances so if there are sales um to go from this location when there should not be um they would be enforced the same as any other um establishment selling flavored tobacco products that should not be because they will be prohibited and we've been contracting with the county to have their enforcement of our tobacco retail license ordinance. And so those mechanisms are in place and we, we do utilize them to um, do undercover sting operations um, and that type of enforcement. We can also enforce it independently as well. Okay. It, it, enforcement would fall to you as a city, uh, city attorney that, um, so you would, be the lead for filing of a complaint under violation of the city ordinance if it's a city city code violation yes we can enforce it by administrative citation we could enforce it potentially and criminally we could enforce it as a nuisance in civil court if needed so there's a whole um, menu of options 
and tools available to enforce violations of the city code. Okay. Uh, Mayor, that's the only uh, questions that I had and uh, of staff. Can I, I have a couple questions, Mayor. Yes, please, Council Member Dan. So um, it, what, I, what I'm hearing is that they do sell alcohol in the form of a bar where somebody walks up and, and, and buys alcohol. And then they have the hookah bar, which is totally the opposite or, or different. Is that just like a restaurant where you can buy food and you can be 21 and come into the place, even though they have a bar at the restaurant? So, um, or is it like a regular bar where you can't walk in unless you're over 21? I don't have a specific answer to that question. Staff might, although I can tell you that under our city code, it is not unlawful to smoke um, outside of a restaurant establishment. So we do prohibit smoking at places of employment that are indoors, but um, other locations such as Crown and Anchor, I think have um, smoking on their its patio. Um, and so I, Maybe this activity is taking place outside on the patio, but I'd have to defer to staff on that. Yeah, I, so, I'm so 18 year olds can come into this establishment then. That, that is our understanding. Uh, according to uh, the business owners' answers to some questions on their Yelp page, uh, individuals can be 18 and, uh, and smoke non nicotine hookahs. So they do allow those who are 18 and up. Uh, to use uh, non-tobacco hookahs and uh, and also to consume just food only under 18, it appears. Okay. Well, which, which is where the problem comes in, yeah, which is back me, to the issue, does. access. Yeah. Can, can I ask a question? Absolutely, then we'll go to Councilman Borallen. Well, I, I have one more question. Okay, go ahead, please. Councilman yeah. Burdan. I was just gonna. Oh. Is, is it about this? So yeah, I, I'm just wondering. Can we just include language that supports clarity around the age restriction? Or, or can we just put a restriction of 21 in the building? Right. That I think that was that that was a question earlier in the evening. Yes, it was. Yeah. Oh, and okay. the answer was the potential problem with that would be like, for example, at Crown and Anchor, you can be a a minor and go eat dinner. Mm -hmm. at that restaurant and there is still smoking a lot on the patio and so if my understanding is that individuals under 21 are allowed to go to this business now um that's just a, a something to consider if the state law um a poll is um goes into effect if the referendum fails then that 21 year age restriction will automatically apply in the city of monterey regardless of what what we may or may not regulate to, to clarify, how does that prevent us from saying, creating a, including a age restriction ban um, for smoking flavored tobacco, right? Like, could, couldn't we include something in there that says that flavored tobacco cannot be consumed by those under the age of 21? I believe that's already part of Part of state law. What's the age restriction for what's the age restriction for smoking? 21 at the state level, 21. State state law is 21. Yes. Correct. Yeah. So an 18 year old who is smoking nicotine is in violation in the premises. What Nat is saying, smoking of non-nicotine at 18 would be legal yes do i have that right the use of herbal shisha which does not include tobacco or nicotine would not fall under that right. i think it would be very difficult to regulate the use of those two products well especially if we have code enforcement that's on site and we're expecting them to figure out what's in the container that's been mixed before the enforcer walked in they certainly see the conduct. They know what they're using is the machine, the bottle, the hose, but nobody has any idea what's in the elixir of whether it's nicotine or not. And that makes this an impossible enforcement. Yes. 
Uh, Council Member Allen. Thank you. So yeah, I did bring this up earlier, and what I heard staff say was that they're looking at bringing back um, an age restriction, and uh, I'd be happy to include that. Whether it's legal or not, I think we could at least add direct staff to look into that and to bring it back um, so that only people 21 and older would go in the establishment. I thought I heard the owner say that that's what they do. Maybe they don't, but I think we want to make sure that the law says you have to be 21 or older to go in there. Oh. And then again, sort of just for, I think, purposes of of uh, comparison and balance, I would just note that alcoholism is a dangerous and addictive disease. Alcoholism is a serious problem for our youth. And you youth can go into almost any restaurant in our city uh, where food is served. And it's quite possible they could be there with a friend who's 21, a parent, someone else who orders alcohol and gives them some. So I just think that's important to note because we're focused sort of on one thing now. Um, but, um, you know, it, it, if we're really focused on youth, then let's try to make sure youth are not in that establishment. Thank you, Alan. I agree with that. I just have one more question. Uh, it's not a question. It's more of a clarification. Mm -hmm. but it's obvious that this establishment is grandfathered in. If any other hookah bars pop up, they're under uh, the current ordinance that they cannot sell at any time flavored tobacco, correct? Want to make sure of that. Well, look, further than that, they can't sell and they can't operate. Right. They, they couldn't so, open. Okay. Yeah. Right. Just wanted to make sure. Chrissy, is that right? Right. And then um, if I could just ask one clarifying question, if, if this is going to come back again at another date, um, as far as restricting those under 21, are you envisioning if this is being consumed on the patio, that the patio would be restricted to age 21 and up, but in other parts of the establishment under 21 is allowed? Or are you contemplating like nobody under 21 in the building, under 21 in the building? Mr. Mayor, if I, if I may add to that question as well, uh, I have similar actually concerns uh, the, the, the city attorney based in questions, but I think uh, we are exceeding uh, really our authority. This is uh, Indian summer called a bar and a grill. Um, when we just say uh, we prohibit uh, anyone younger than 21 to enter there, um, that that I think uh, is inviting for is, in, is an invitation for huge conflicts uh, with that operator. Um, and and I, I would uh, very much ask the council to not um, go there because, uh, again, that will open up the floodgates for many other questions why we wouldn't do it differently. Now, I understand the, the council's um, desire to protect uh, the youth, and I understand also the challenges that we have with code compliance to say what is um nicotine free and what is uh contains to that tobacco products um the the owner is on the record to state that they don't sell uh hookahs to anyone younger than 21 we will research that and 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 and, and check that out last but not least uh the biggest challenge is that's what the owner told us when when she spoke uh Councilman albert and the the, the biggest topic that, that we shouldn't lose sight out of that is that uh, Indian summer is not the place where, where the high school students drop by and buy their stuff on the way home. Uh, that That's uh, part of, of the 98% of our proposed ordinance to protect the youth in those establishments that currently sell hookah products uh, uh, for, for, for their private consumption and and to protect that is is i think what what we will achieve with this ordinance so i really want to uh, add this sort of caution uh, don't go there with a 21 year old to, to just restrict the business uh, abc has a license there abc is enforcing also all the abc topics there and uh, I think the uh, this establishment has been operating there. We haven't heard any concern about selling to to under twenty one year old there. 
uh, hooker products and we'll keep an eye on that but uh, i really want to caution council to not make it too hard on us so so to make sure if you come if you come back and with a, a different uh, opinion or recommendation and we have to decide that we're going to change what we're doing tonight then we're coming back for another second right no you you would come back uh changing the ordinance because uh, if you if you stick to, to this ordinance for the next second reading then we see if it works but but if i can offer um a, a commentary to our city manager's opinion which i respect and agree with there is always the other option in the future if this was a site that created problems we certainly have enforcement av yeah. available if they we find that the problem is on the patio with 18 year olds mixing with the 21 year olds and it's hard for us to regulate we could in fact cause an ordinance to say that the use of hookah has to be segregated and out on the patio not so that an under 21 year old could not be out on the patio so that's something we could consider uh in the future with more analysis more study yes. once we've identified that there's a problem of the outside patio with the use of the hookah with the mixed ages okay. um, but i wouldn't want to get in the way of the state abc law that that issues them a license and a permit to sell on-site alcohol with meals and i want to plug in for all of hospitality they are required to do um hospitality service oriented awareness and education about serving people alcohol so there isn't a bartender that exists in this town that probably is operating without having taken the cautionary classes and education that reminds them that they are liable if they're serving someone under 21. So I think it is like every other place incumbent on the server, uh, the manager, the employees uh, to help regulate this to make sure that nobody is getting in trouble. So this is another example of it may not be alcohol, but the management on site and those that are serving their patrons have a responsibility to make sure that they um, enforce the ordinance and not let an under 21 year old participate in hookah uh, activities. Otherwise, then we have an enforcement problem. Maybe, maybe, uh, thank you, Ed. Maybe I didn't make myself clear here. Maybe I'll explain this again. If we ever vote on this tonight, which I hope we do, um, <laughs> then we come back and um, the, the staff has something else and we decide, oh, I think we'll change it again. Do we have to go back to another second? Let's vote. You know, it would be, uh, uh, Council Member Dan, it would just simply be an amendment to the ordinance that would take a first and a second. Okay. All right. I'm done. Yeah. And you know what? This discussion on hookah has pretty much dominated our, our hearings for the last two or three times. And I'm just thinking to keep the eye on the prize. The whole point of this ordinance is to prohibit flavored tobacco in whatever form. and I, I, hookah got became very dominant in our discussion, but I just remember why are we trying to pass this ordinance? And that's to uh, prohibit and ban flavored tobacco. And so let's do that. If we need to come back and look at hookah bars, that's the topic for another uh, day as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. So why don't we go ahead and do roll call, please? <laughs> Again, the, the motion would include the uh, red lining that explains uh, the, the operation of one one facility, but does include hookah in the ban of flavored tobacco products. Roll call, please. Councilmember Hoffa. Yes. Councilmember Albert. Yes. Councilmember Williamson. Yes. Councilmember Smith. Uh, yes, and I want to note, Mayor. Uh, I think staff's ready to show us the new wording for the heading of uh, char uh, chapter 19. So we might want to uh, have them have a chance to do that. All right, let's finish our vote and we'll go back to look at the new wording. Thank you for that. And Mayor Roberson? Yes, I'm curious, 5-0. So did we want to, a final slide just to clarify what the council just passed? <laughs> 
just for, for clarity, there, there's the title that we've modified. No other changes. Okay, and that's that's clearly understood by the council and was contained in the motion. That's accurate. Thank you. All right, that's good. Well, since we're cleaning up this afternoon's uh, agenda, why don't we go ahead with item 21 right now, adopt a resolution establishing compensation and benefit packages for unrepresented employees. And so I will again turn to our principled city manager. Do you have a, a brief uh, presentation on that or not? Yes, and, and I'm the only unrepresented um employee in the room uh, who, who can actually present this item so <laughs> you talk about me separately uh, so yes. this, uh, this is basically a continuation or an extension of the existing new labor agreements we have uh, five labor agreements now in place with five different la labor groups one of them um, yeah. or two of them are affected by that uh, uh, the two labor agreements that that the council has uh, signed off on are the Monterey Executive Management uh, Employee Association, as well as the Management Empl uh, Employee Association. And part of, of our setup in the city is that certain employees are not part of those associations because they are working together with you on labor negotiations. And these are basically the unrepresented confidential employees. And what we are asking you tonight is to approve uh, the same uh, labor agreements that have been granted to to the other labor groups and give uh, extended to the unrepresented confidential executive management, which is a four percent salary increase effective July first, twenty twenty two, and also uh, next year July first for four percent, as well as uh, the current health uh, plan spending fund contributions for twenty twenty three and for the plan year twenty twenty four. Only the city shall increase its country not to exceed 9% to the new PERS gold premiums. And in essence, it's the same for the unrepresented confidential employees, uh, which are including then um, the assistant finance director, assistant human resources director, HR coordinator, uh, human resources specialist, and the human resources assistant. So all those will be included in that as well as well as uh, if they are unrepresented part-time, regular part-times, they also will have the two uh, increases of 4% July 1st, 2022, and respectively July 1st, 2023. And that, that is my brief presentation. Thank you, and that was very adequately explained in the staff report. Uh, is there any public comment? Anyone in the chambers wanted to address this? Not here in city council chambers, Mr. Mayor. And how about online, please? There is nobody with their hand raised. All right, back to the council. Questions, action, what is your pleasure? Move to approve. Uh, second. I'll second. All right, so I think it was council member Dan who made the motion and I think, who got it in first? Council member Ed? I think or Ed did. Ed, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I will yield to my colleague from Minnesota. My jeopardy <laughs> button. <laughs> Roll call, please. Council member Williamson? Yes. Council member Albert? Yes. Councilmember Hoffa? Yes. Councilmember Smith? Yes. And Mayor Overson? Yes, that carries 5 0. And we don't have any announcements for closed session since we did not meet. We have one consent item, um, which is interesting an evening consent item. And anyone in the public wanted to address this one? Chambers online? Not in chambers. And not online. Okay, council, uh, ready to move on that? Um, I'm not seeing a consent item number 22. 20, no, number 22. 22, okay, got it. Uh, I'll move to approve. All right. I'll second. Second. That's why it's separated. Okay, I see, yep. Got it, got it. Okay, roll call, please. Council member Smith? Yes. Council member Hoffa? Yes. Council member Williamson? Yes. Council member Albert? Yes. And Mayor Roberson? And uh, yes, that carries 5 0. All right, on to the evening agenda. And that's uh, number one and number two are really tied together quite tightly. And I would ask uh, our professional city attorney would there be any problem to open public comment on both of those? Or it's really, uh, we have to be very strict about 
discuss one and then the other? We we should discuss them separately. Okay, thank you, since they're agendized separately. All right, let's have a brief uh, staff presentation. This again is a topic that we've discussed a number of times. I have some new thoughts I wanna share with you, but I would like to hear first uh, a presentation, questions, public, then I'll share some thoughts I've had. So let's turn it again back to our principal city manager. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Mayor, Council. Um, this topic has been in front of you, um, I think, a few times. Uh, we uh, last time we we had two brief presentations, also by Midpen as well as by First Community Housing, about the uh, proposed uh, or suggested projects. Uh, tonight we we are presenting to you for those two sites uh, that the council is uh, considering. Uh, two uh, exclusive negotiating agreements uh, that we have uh, jointly worked on between our legal team and our management team, as well as the, the teams of the two uh, affordable housing developers. And um, without further ado, we have um, very short presentations for you prepared uh, to um, present to you our exclusive negotiating agreements. Again, uh, for those who, who uh, like me to remind you always what an exclusive negotiating agreement is. It's like becoming engaged uh, with, with a partner. Uh, you're offering them a ring, but you're not quite sure if you will want mm -hmm. to actually marry the person. So uh, an <laughs> negotiating agreement is basically saying, hey, we, we, we will talk, we will stick together, we will figure it all out. And if at the end of that, uh, we come to, to a wonderful conclusion, then then uh, we will enter into a contract, or uh, which is which is in other words also a marriage. So uh, that's why this is always a good uh, comparison. Uh, what an exclusive negotiating agreement is? It's it's really a commitment to each other not to cheat on the partner. Stick to to your partner to negotiate, and don't look anywhere else until you figure out that this works or it doesn't work. And that's all what it is. It an exclusive exclusive negotiating agreement does not commit the council. Uh, or future councils to actually do something there. It is just uh, a path uh, forward to figure out uh, how can we make those projects happen. And with that, um, I turn it over to Brand. Mike. Yes, a little rusty getting back into the council chambers from Zoom. Yeah, still not working. No, I heard it just fine here online. So, not working in the chambers yet. Uh, well, they're working on they're working on something here. Okay. Say something, you guys. <laughs> yeah, test your mic. Okay, mic test. Are we good? Okay, online. How about in the chambers? Get as uh, close as you can. It's just not very loud. It's just not loud. Okay, that's, that's, there we go. Better. Okay, my apologies. A little rusty coming back into council after two and a half years of being on Zoom. But yeah, really. Thank you, council and mayors. Um, I'm Grant Leonard, your housing analyst, here to present the exclusive negotiated agreement. First up is for 442 Adams Street, which is with First Community Housing. Just a brief background statement here. Um, we've been working on this project since 2020 when we released the request for proposals, uh, which is intended to help us meet our housing goals as the city continues to suffer from a lack of affordable housing. We received the proposals in October of 2020, and we were directed to begin negotiating these negotiating agreements in February of 2021. Yeah, just last May, two months ago, after a lengthy discussion of the process and where we were at, uh, staff was directed to finalize the ENAs, the exclusive negotiating agreements, and bring them to council for review. Uh, here's a quick summary of terms for the property at Adams Street, which is near the Sports Center. It would be a minimum of 51 units, although the developer has an interest in flexing that up to 64 units if it's feasible. Um, that would be five to six stories in height. It would be 100% low-income housing, 
All of that would be under 60% of the area and median income and as low as 30% as in the area of median income. Uh, this uh, negotiated agreement has an extended term, three-year term with two one-year extensions, giving us five years to finalize the negotiations. Uh, this is an extra long time frame given the uncertainties regarding water credits at the site. Um, the developer is willing to work with the city on development of a local preference policy, which we discussed in May. Uh, this agreement does not include funding commitments, so any future cost sharing agreements will be finalized and brought to council at a later date. So when we finalize the budget costs for pre-development, for example, uh, that'll come back to council for allocation of funds. And this agreement will provide the developer with site access to the site so that they can begin doing their pre-development studies. This is the rendering that was showed in May. Uh, just for quick reference, this was also submitted with their proposal in October of 2020. It includes uh, mixed use, so a little commercial or retail on the first floor and then all residential on the, the upper floors. The next steps would be to proceed with uh, the pre-development studies. That's really the big thing that this agreement allows. Uh, to continue to work with the project designers and the Monterey Peninsula Water Management District to maximize the water credit usage for the sites and to continue to advocate for relief from the cease and desist order for affordable housing as the city has been doing actively for several months, if not years, and then to finalize the uh, negotiation of a development agreement with the developer for the site. And with that, we can take questions. All right, any questions? Uh, yeah, Mayor, I had yes. one. Uh, Grant, if you could uh, show us your slide that had the number of units, I think it was, yeah, 51 units, developers interested in going to 64 units if feasible, five to six stories. What, what defines whether it's five or six stories? Is it um, size of the units or is it, if it goes to 64 units, what what's the deciding? It would be it would be to go to the 64 units if feasible, if there's enough water for the site, um, and if they can uh, get all the other permitting requirements met. Okay, and and how much water is currently available to that site that gets it to 51 units? Well, as we discussed in May, uh, the city has a limited number of water credits to split between the two sites. Um, this site does not currently have a water meter, so we have to investigate submetering from Jack's Park or the Sports Center and um, determining how many water credits are left to split between the two sites of City Hall site behind us and this one. So that's really the next step of negotiating that with Water Management District and the design team. Okay. Um, that's all the questions I had right now. Thank you, Grant. All right. Other questions? Uh, Council Member Allen? Then we'll go to Council Member Dan. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I was wondering, Grant, if we could include some language in the ENA asking the developer to explore um, ocean level rise or flooding resiliency in their development plan. Um, I think there's been some discussion about the potential for that, be, given our, um, you know, study of ocean level rise. But I also, it seems to me, we could plan for that in the development project itself so that the project is more resilient. I guess having commercial on the ground floor at least gives some protection to the residents. But I'm just wondering in general, if that's something that we could look at, my guess is that there are architectural and construction things that could be done to make the project more resilient. Yes, that's an excellent point. Um, as Hans says, this is a, a proposal. Uh, so we're not de defining the final development here. Uh, this is really to give them access to the site to get the pre-development studies done. Um, that type of um, 
clause would be, I think, more appropriate for a development agreement. Yes. So, so uh, Councilmember uh, Hoffa, the ENA uh, would be not the right tool for that, but that is an element that we will put in during the ENA negotiations into the mix. Absolutely. Okay. Thanks. Well, Councilmember Dan, I think you had a question. Yes, I did. Thank you. So, um, under the ENA, does that mean that they can um, they can change from a mixed use to just an apartment complex, or is that still too way down the road? They they can do that with the blessing of the council. So so again, uh, the the ENA is 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 there to 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 outline the general terms, right? And. Uh, the final say of the project lies with with both parties what they are willing to give and to take. So, yes, that could be foreseeably uh, an option that that might might come forward or might not come forward. So, so the reason I bring that up, so if there's not an appetite for six stories, they can instead of doing a mixed use, they can put apartments down below and, and do five. Yes. Okay. Uh, the other questions were were already asked, so I'm good. Mayor, if I may? Yes, please. Um, so if I understand this correctly, the next step would be the pre-development agreement. Uh, so this is the exclusive negotiating agreement and that allows them to begin their pre-development studies. So their environmental work, their geotechnical work, um, et cetera. And then uh, that enters into the development agreement as the next major milestone after we uh, complete that work. Okay, and then how, what is the time frame? What are we looking at? I, I know that it's of course not like a set established thing, but what what can we anticipate as as far as the time frame? Uh, well, the terms for this one are initial term of three years with two one year extensions, uh, and that again is because of the uncertainty of the water for the site. So, so Councilmember Williamson, it depends also on how the teams are working. Uh, uh, I was part of an ENA. A long time ago uh, where basically our partner was taking uh, their sweet time and uh, it seemed not to be moving forward at all and it took way longer than we had hoped for uh, so it's it can it can be all done within a in a shorter time frame so so both teams if they are committed and working and have uh, turnaround times and they go through the various steps um, it can be all done in, 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 in two years' time that, that we have something that we bring forward as a project. Again, there are a lot of known unknowns right now that we have to deal with. Uh, giving three-year term with two, year, two one-year extensions is basically saying, you know, there are so many uh, uncertainties and water is one of the largest ones. Uh, let's give us, give, give us some time. But I think if both teams are committed, uh, which the city team for, for sure is, uh, if the obstacles are, are um, removed, uh, we we can go through that in, in two years or three years time. What happens if we if we get to the two year extension period? Do they have, do we have to go through this whole process again of doing an RFP and like what does that look like? It, it's your pleasure. Uh, again, it's it's like do you want to continue with the partner? Uh, you will know in in three years, for instance, sure. you will know how serious were they, what are the obstacles. And you, you might just say, you know, hey, uh, let's go out for an RFP. Let's let's try to try maybe someone else. Maybe this doesn't pencil out, or maybe the council has different priorities and wants to do something differently, uh, and the partner doesn't want to go there. So you might might go out for an RFP again. Um, like I always say, also the council, if you get a good offer. Uh, and you have the stomach for it, you can go also and make the appropriate findings and, and go sole source. If someone comes along and says, hey, I pay for everything and you can tell me anything you want me and I will do it, why would we go through the process of an RFP? You can sole source it at that time. So uh, all options are there. I, and again, keep, keep the picture in mind that I said about the engagement because that's really the process here. You You may find out it works great and, and you want to marry as soon as possible, so. Thank you. So I, I come up with another question, sorry. So yeah. when is the CEQA um, process involved, traffic studies? Because that we're gonna, as soon as this project gets out there, the neighborhoods are gonna ask questions like that because they think now it's gonna be built next week no. and, and it's not obviously. So is there something we can tell them about uh, when it comes to the CEQA process? 
Yeah, yeah. so first of all, uh, I want to reiterate the enthusiasm the developers showed in May. Uh, they're very eager to work on this project. Uh, they'd like to get it moving as quickly as possible. Uh, they just need to be cognizant of the uh, various restrictions and problems we have here in the area. Uh, SQL will be determined through this process. We'll work on that. There are a lot of exemptions for SQL for affordable housing, so those need to be explored. Um, you know, what type of funding to use? Is it federal funding? Does it require federal environmental review, et cetera? So all that will be worked through during this process, but um, certainly it's not going to construction in the next couple of weeks. But, well, let, let, let me be more clearer than this because uh, that was not clear enough. We don't have a project. This is not a project whatsoever. Uh, once we have a project, once you approve that project, because it's our property and you are intimately involved with that, then we start the whole process with that. We don't have a project. We are years away from a project yet. So uh, again, the neighbors can sleep easy right now because uh, again, we are just trying to figure out, do we want to have a project there? How will it look like? Once, once we have made that finding, that determination, also, once we have agreed about the size, et cetera, then we have a project. Then you start the whole process with, with the planning for, for CEQA, et cetera. So we are not uh, anywhere close to CEQA or anything like that. And if I made a mistake, Tim, correct me. No, I didn't. Okay, thank you. That's my questions, I promise. Uh, no, this is important. All right. Um, I think Mike, my, my question, did everyone, the council, everybody get a chance to answer their questions? Uh, Tyler, did you finish your questions? Yeah, and, and I have a point that's a question slash a comment, and I'm just wondering if there's space for us to create a, I don't know if a one pager is appropriate, but just kind of an, an outline that kind of helps the public or kind of leading to Dan's point where if we're getting questions or people in the public want to know, like, what is the right process where I can insert my concerns about X, Y, and Z, I think it would be helpful for folks that might be able to yeah. visualize that a little bit better. Yeah. That's a good point. This is going to be very complicated. However, to just not only the process, but there's a lot of elements we we don't know what's going to happen yet. My question is with respect to water mm -hmm. and is there enough water to do one of these projects versus two? Uh, yes, as we discussed in May, um, there is enough water credits for one development. We're very close to having enough for two. Uh, that's why we're continuing to work on that with the water management district and the developers design teams. Yeah, well, I would just tell you as the mayor's rep to uh, the water management district, I would advise that you take a look at the gray, wa gray water ordinance and gray water is not an option under current water management district policy and i won't get into the reasons why or why not so you just need to keep that in mind let's see if uh, there's public comment then, Mayor, if, if the if kim can just talk briefly about the water uh, because i think that is worthwhile information sharing as well yeah, I do okay. want to point out the the one other significant um, issue that we need to work through is the meter issue. Usually we need a two inch meter to serve projects of this size. We have multiple meters behind City Hall serving the individual structures. Um, so we are going to have to look at how to or be creative on how the water will be supplied to that project. The project on Adams Street is much more tenuous in terms of its water meter. The water meter is located across the street in the city park um, and may very well require us to work with multiple agencies to try to resolve this issue. Well, while we have our expert professional community development director, a uh, question <laughs> I would have is, would the Coastal Commission weigh in on uh, Adam Street, because it is in a potential a seawater level area and a flood zone. So Del Monte Avenue is our coastal zone boundary in that area. So it's outside the coastal zone. Okay. Um, it's on the very edge of the maximum flooding area that we're looking at in the long term. So 
that's one thing to keep in mind. We are going to have to start working with all these projects on tsunami run-up zones. Yes. So we'll consider and work with the developer on those issues. I think a really good potential lesson learned is if you can take all your mechanical systems and put them on the roof or put them up higher, if your lower levels flood periodically, that you know your entire mechanical system is not ruined for the building. That's one thing we learned um, with the Aquariums Education Center on Cannery Row. They moved all their, if you look at that building, there's some resiliency built into that building with the idea that the lower levels could possibly flood over time and the mechanical equipment won't be ruined for the building. So I think there are some strategies as we work with the development teams. Okay, thank you. Let's see, do we have people in the uh, council chambers who want to speak on this item? We do not, Mr. Mayor. Do we have anyone online who'd like to uh, share in our discussion? Yes, we do. Uh, <coughs> first, let's hear from Kurt Tipton. So Kurt, please go ahead. Hello, council. Thank you for taking my call. I'm Kurt Tipton, president of the Downtown Neighborhood Association. And so, I am gonna express some of the citizens' concerns. If you remember when you did the downtown overlay, there was a three-story um, development that you wanted to do and the uproar was mighty. And now you wanna do six. Can you imagine what the uproar is gonna be? Also, I'll bring it up again, is parking. There are 42 spaces in the current Adams lot, I believe. And you're probably with 51 units or so, you're probably looking at 71 cars. I know council is adamant that public transportation will be there, but in reality, low income, they probably are doing two, a male and a female, or a couple working different shifts. So they're gonna have to have a car. Where are you gonna put all these extra cars? There's no parking around Jack's Park in the other places is already taken up. Also, if you think you haven't done it yet, but you need to really pay attention to the geological studies. I know here on Pearl Street, if you have a basement, you have a sump pump and the mm -hmm. water level is right there. And we don't want this structure to, will that lot support six stories or will it turn into the Millennium Tower like San Francisco? So those types of things really need to be looked at. And I understand, I'm gonna bring up sea level rise. The city needs to update their model. There are new data points out there. There are also, the Coastal Commission is saying you should use the worst case scenarios in most instances, rather than using the best case or the middle case. So I believe the city really needs to go back through and look at the sea level rise models because they believe that the Adams Street is going to be right smack in the middle of it. Thank you. Thank you, Kurt. Next, let's hear from Esther Malkin. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I wanted to just um, point out that in the context of the public understanding anything that we're talking about when it comes to AMI, if that dollar amount of what AMI is at the current time can be mentioned, because I can tell you that absolutely nobody outside of anything in the housing related arena knows what that means. They have no idea. So when you put that percentage up, it has no context whatsoever. So I, I suggest doing that in all future presentations. I realize that that changes, but it's not gonna change significantly. And at least it gives a ballpark uh, for the public to understand what is actually considered low income in our area so that they can clearly understand where the renters of the community are going to have to be in their income levels to qualify for any of these units because Unlike staff that's getting 4% or executives are getting 4% increases in their salaries, 
Renters and low income workers do not get that kind of an increase, yet they are somehow expected by the city, uh, by the state bill, AB 1480, to come up with a maximum of 10% annual interest, uh, in, in, increases in their rents that compounds every year. And for context, in, over the course of 10 years, renters will be paying well over 100% of the rent from when the bill started two years ago. That's a short term bill. It's got seven and a half years left on it. So I think it's really important for the public to understand what AMI is so that they don't think that you have to be basically destitute or that you do have to be destitute to qualify for these and who is being left out because they supposedly make too much money. So I just wanted to bring that up because I know that that's a term that's gonna be used a lot and very few people outside of who's, who's attending right now, not public, but you, know, you guys and staff and anybody in the housing arena knows what that actually means. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, next we have Jeffrey Morgan. Hi, this is a, a, I'm president of First Community Housing. And first of all, I just wanted to thank um, all of the, uh, you know, members of city council for considering this. And I support uh, the staff's recommendations uh, for an exclusive negotiating agreement and also appreciate the cooperation we got in working with MidPen on a study of water consumption that that seems to indicate we can move forward with two uh, developments um, based on some of the technologies excluding gray water. And also uh, look forward to working with the community. This is just the very beginning of what will be a lengthy process. And we we welcome that engagement with the community. And we, we're very interested in, in looking at making sure this is a very resilient building into the future. So I'm, I'm available for any questions. Thank you. Thank you. And there are no further hands raised, Mr. Mayor. All right, uh, very good. Uh, I'll bring it back to the council. When I introduced this, I said I, I had some thoughts I'd like to share with you. And uh, as a result of our public hearings, I, I always wanna be sure that I keep an open mind. I'm not sure I'm ready to go for an exclusive negotiating agreement on the Adams Street site. And I just, uh, and again, I'm open to a, a really vigorous, uh, deeper conversation with the council. But a couple of things came to mind since our last meeting and during the meeting. And one of is uh, we've heard over and over again, the need for workforce housing. And I'm committed to, city property uh, for affordable housing, 100%. But I'm just thinking that we might want to be focusing on city, the city workforce as many school districts and other jurisdictions are doing. In fact, I've had discussions with uh, several entities, governmental and non-governmental, and private property owners as well, talking to them about using some of their land for uh, housing. And then I took a look, and I think this is correct, if, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, that, uh, Grant, the last time we talked about this, I think we were looking at $700,000 per unit to build this project, not counting land cost. Is that about right, round numbers? Uh, yes, that's what uh, affordable housing development is going for these days with the labor shortage and inflation, et cetera. Good, thank you. Well, I talked to a very successful builder friend of mine, and he, he estimated with, uh, with land costs, his cost would be 400 to $450,000 per unit. So the cost of this concerns me very much. And also if there's going to be a need for more city money. And also with the water question, it seems to me we might be uh, wise to focus on one property rather than two and take a look at the uh, Madison Street. And I have some ideas on that. So six stories in a historical district, a cultural district, uh, to me is excessive, even five. 
even Landwatch talks about higher density, and I'm not against higher densities, but we should be looking at transportation corridors. For example, you take a look at the former Eddy site. Do you drop a six story tower right in the middle of a historical, athletic, cultural part of the city that's not on a transportation corridor? I don't think that's a good planning. And so those are questions I, I think I'm more than happy to talk about. And this is why I'm leaning towards, uh, let's take a look and I'll share my comments for that. Let's take a look at one site that doesn't have some of these liabilities attached to it that's more feasible. And again, uh, if council disagrees with me, that's okay. But I, I just think it, I don't wanna see um, our nonprofit and our city staff spending years of studies, agreements and so on than on a project that I don't really feel is feasible. Whereas I think Madison Street has an extraordinary amount of potential. So my thought would be on this one to uh, table it for now, not kill it, but I think there's too many ifs and what fors, not to mention what Kurt said, which is parking, uh, sea level rise, et cetera. I, I, to me, this, I just don't wanna see a, a lot of time spent on a project that has too many obstacles. But on the other hand, I think Madison Street has a great deal of potential and with the water, it's something we can do sooner than later. So I just put that on the table for discussion, my friends. I'm just not ready to uh, go into an agreement yet. I, there's just too many un, unanswered questions for me. Um, Mayor, this is Ed. Yes, please. May I uh, opine in a conversation? And please disagree and agree, and let's have one of those famous conversations that keep me up at night. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I, I agree with you. Um, so I've considered this site ever since we started talking about the listed locations uh, probably two years ago. And uh, I've, I've spent some time in the neighborhood. I've spent some time at the ballpark and I've uh, looked at that location. I'm very much familiar with the location. Um, yeah, I've never really thought that it's an appropriate location for uh, the largeness. When we saw this presentation, I was uh, frankly shocked that the the numbers were so large on the cost so large on its density, 51 up to 64, uh, five stories or six. Uh, the location has significant challenges for it to be a profitable site for a build. Um, I've got grave concerns over um, a large building in that location because once a large building like that could be approved and built, and I know this is a, an E and A. This is the this the dance, the you know the engagement, and I appreciate the analogy, but I don't want to date someone when I have no possibility of taking to a second date, <laughs> or to a movie, or or giving them a ring. I don't want to disappoint someone uh, just because I want to tease and play around. I want to be open and transparent with first communities and just say I just don't think it's the appropriate project for that location. I think they're uh, they're credible. They're great. They've got some ideas. They're obviously very creative, and they could probably bring some solutions to other parts of the community. But I just think that's the wrong place. Too much impact to the community. Too high loss of parking. Um, so I just don't see the point. Overriding all of that, I always ask the question: What are we trying to achieve here at the end of the day? We still own the property. We can always change our mind in the future when water becomes available. Um, I don't see any benefits in having a partnership with First Community while we're having to spend a lot of labor, a lot of time um, trying to navigate through the pathway of no water. I just think it's too early. If we had a clear timeline of water solutions, um, we didn't have massive engineering questions with the district fighting the problem of metering. We know what that's been like. We we had to do that with some, one of our own projects. So I just don't see what we gain out of an early, um, you know, three-year agreement 
while they're working to get through all the challenges and identify the challenges. And at the end of the day, I think we're going to still right, be right back where we are. And we're going to say, well, it's nice to build it, but here's what's happened since. Now it's 800,000 a unit. And oh, by the way, we still don't have water. If something changes in the community, um, I would say a smaller build, but that location is valuable property for parking in a sporting arena neighborhood with nothing else around it that's anywhere near that size. So wrong project, wrong location. I want to preserve that location for something that's more appropriate. And right now, parking is appropriate and valuable. And I've spoken with many of the neighbors that live in the area, and they really, really are uncomfortable with um, even going to uh, a first date with a project like this. So I say, sorry, uh, let's go our separate ways. And maybe the developer can find another piece of property in the city that's more appropriate where uh, it's going to make sense, but not on Adams Street for me. Thank you, Council Member Allen. Uh, yeah, thank you. So I just want to remind Council why we're having this conversation. California has a housing crisis. Monterey has an even worse housing crisis than the state as a whole. We have a housing crisis because too many communities and too many neighborhoods and too many city councils have found too many reasons to say no to new housing. That's why we have a housing crisis. We have too many people who need housing and too often we have found all kinds of reasons to say no. So there's an undersupply of housing for the demand. So we have a few people who for whatever reason don't want this project, but the reality is, as staff said, we're not even talking about a project. We're just talking about an idea and exploring an idea and then working with the community to try and find a poss possibly find a project that would work for the community and would meet our housing needs. So I just think that needs to be said. I would also just note, this isn't the time to go small ball. This is the time to go big ball, hit it out of the, hit it out of the ballpark, not a single. We don't need a single, we need a home run. So we need the project we'll be talking about in a minute up near City Hall, but we need this. And we actually, honestly, we need more, way more. And we know that. So I just think that's important context before we even get into any of the rest of it. The cost, yeah, the cost is crazy, but guess what? We don't have to build, we don't have to pay for it. That's not what we're talking about tonight. We're not, so that should not even be a consideration in my opinion, because if it was the cost that a developer is gonna have to pay, then we would, you know, we'd never build anything again. But that's their concern. They're going to have to figure out if it pencils out or not. Obviously, they think it could, or they wouldn't be wanting to enter into this agreement. Um, the location. So again, we're not actually talking about a project, so the potential height could change. But I just note that I'm trying to look at a map here and it'd actually be good if staff could put a map up, but um, two blocks, two blocks to the, to the south of this project, you have um, the city's parking garage. How big is that? You have the Bank of America. How big is that? And I think is it three blocks you get to you, you get to El Dorado Street. How big are some of the buildings there? Four or five stories. And four blocks you get over to it's definitely a six-story building there. Uh old, old, old building. I don't remember the name of that building. I think the Maradas were in that building at one time, or maybe they still are. You're probably talking about professional there. building. Bingo. So what I'm saying is, you're saying, oh my gosh, whoa, this is completely out of character. No, it isn't. 
it's completely within character, in my opinion. It, I guess it all depends on which way you're looking. If you're looking towards the downtown, and I think this is right on the edge of the downtown and, and the neighborhood on the other side, it's kind of in the middle of it. It's completely consistent. Parking. We have two parking garages that, again, are within two blocks of this proposed site that are underutilized. They're almost never full. City-owned parking garages. And I just have to say, like, when are we as a society going to stop fetishizing cars? Like, cars. Everything is about cars and parking. What about people? And what about places for people to live? So I guess I'm, I'm just tired of parking being, no, people can't live here and I'm sorry, they're going to have to be homeless or be priced out of, out of our community. Um, let's see. And I guess the last thing I would say is if we, del if, if we, if we defer this tonight, if we table this tonight, we are killing it. We're killing it. So let's not have any illusions. You're killing it. Um, it's not going to come up again. This is, this is, this is something that's, even if it does happen, it's going to take years, which is crazy and sad. It is, it's going to take years, even if we do move forward. And if we don't move forward, it's not going to happen. Oh, last thing, water. I mean, water is an issue. But guess what? If there isn't any water, all the, ha all the NIMBYs can be happy. If it turns out that we can't solve the meter problem or we can't solve the water problem, congratulations to all the NIMBYs, you win, as you usually do on these issues. Um, but five years, a lot can change in five years. A lot can change in five years. And uh, we may well have the water we need. We may have the water we need before then. So I don't think you should say because water is a challenge that we shouldn't move forward with exploring this possibility. That's all we're talking about is exploring the possibility. And parking, my God, two blocks away, you got those parking garages. And gosh, when are we going to start doing something other than worrying about cars? All right, those are my thoughts. Thank you, Alan. Anyone else? You want me to go? Okay. Yeah, sure. Okay, here, I'll, I'll go now. Next, uh, Clyde. Okay, so, Council Member Dan, please. So, um, um, it's difficult because uh, the only way that we can create uh, affordable housing is through properties that the city owns because it's just too expensive for developers to develop in a in a property that has it's worth $5 million. We've already experienced that in one of our projects down on Franklin Street. Uh, we, we thought we were gonna get something. The, the contractor came back and said, well, I can't afford it. And that's, that's just a private piece of property. So to use the city's properties for what uh, one of our, um, one of our, our top uh, goals which is affordable housing, I, I, I think that's important for us because I think that's the only way we're going to get affordable housing is in our own properties. However, and that's a big however, is mm -hmm. that if you remember the Garden, uh, Garden Road property, there we thought we were going to get lots of housing and we talked, I, it must've been three or four meetings, we changed zones, bam, we don't have any water. So that project is dead. Mm -hmm. To me, <laughs> folks, if we don't have water, we can't do this project. So I would prefer the staff to come back and say, okay, here's what we did. We took those two meters, we brought them together. Now we have enough water to build this project. And then I say, let's go, let's go for it. I mean, in the sense that, um, that everybody agrees on what type of, well, I'm not supposed to say the word project because it's not a project yet, mm -hmm. but whatever is supposed to be built on that on that uh, that site. But but to me, to go down that same road that we did with Garden Road, where we got really excited about hundreds of, of units, then all of a sudden they're not available anymore because we don't have water. So I, I agree with Alan. In five years, it may happen. 
but I've lived on this peninsula quite a few years and it ain't happened yet. So uh, I don't know how that, that's gonna work out. As, as it comes to, to size, um, to me, and, and I know the mayor is gonna laugh at this because he's probably heard it before, size to me is all about what the, what the building looks like. If, hey, if, I've heard if, that before. Have you heard it a couple of times, Clay? <laughs> if it's a beautiful <laughs> building, um, I don't think I would agree to a 10 story building, but if it's a beautiful building and it, and it enhances the neighborhood or enhances the area, uh, I'm not opposed to that, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. But but on the other hand, though, again, again, even though I understand, Alan, what you're saying, it shouldn't be a, a barrier, but it's reality. It is a barrier. So for me, I'd like to see the staff come back and, and solve the water problem first before we uh, we really take a close look at this. All right. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Tyler, do you have some thoughts you'd share with us, please? Yeah. So when I think about this topic of housing overall, because this is what this is really about. It's about creating housing for people that work and live here. I think about those that are working in jobs, whether it be hospitality, retail, uh, police, fire, nurses, doctors that are working here. I'm thinking of all these various public servant positions. Um, there's this certain level of missing middle um, folks that that are are maybe don't necessarily even qualify for affordable units. Um, but we also do have an expectation that we are to meet with our RENA allocation and making sure that we are providing housing for folks of certain incomes, um, which there is obviously uh, a need for. So. I'm thinking of these people, I'm thinking of these families as I'm listening to all the feedback from my colleagues in regards to how we should move forward with this site. And to me, it's so critically important that we take an all hands approach um, to the housing problem if we're saying that it's a priority for our community, by not supporting this today, it is more or less the same of kicking the can down the road. We're saying not today, let's let the future generations take care of this, let's wait five years, and then let's add another additional 10 years to that for the development to actually occur. When we have the opportunity today to allow this to move forward in a space where this can, Play, there's can be a discovery process. And this might actually end up working out better than the project here behind City Hall, because through that discovery process, we might discover something that we realize it's a huge barrier that prevents us. So now what did we do? We shot ourselves in the foot because we can't move forward on either project. And I think it's such a failure for us to sit here today and say, I've heard from maybe select few representatives from points of view. At the end of the day, we all have to look inside our hearts and our minds and think about where, like where, what perspective in which we come from. And at the end of the day, whichever perspective you come from, you can make arguments to support that cause. Um, so I'll go through some of the arguments just to create an, uh, a, a counter narrative. And, and I appreciate you, Alan, for getting to some of these, but I want to reinforce. Um, Mayor, you had um, mentioned about kind of the need for our city workforce and creating workforce housing. Absolutely, there's an absolute need there. I was just speaking to some of that missing middle and how there's a need. So let's do that also. Let's not say we can't do this because we need to prioritize this. There's nothing happening there. And nobody on the council has proposed anything or pushed anything forward to allow that to come to fruition yet. But we have something here today on our agenda that we can support and allow that process to move forward and prevent and create an experience for a developer who's chomping at the bit to work with us to move this forward. Um, I just wanna give some examples of, of things that are happening I recently listened to a, a podcast and there's this organization called Catalyst Housing. 
and they're working with jurisdictions on methodologies that, and it's a complicated thing, so I, I won't get too technical here, but it allows for bonds to happen, for investors to support the purchasing of property, and they give that property to uh, the city, and that removes some of the cost for property tax, right? Because the city owns it, it's for the public good, and it's eliminating a lot of the cost. These are creative solutions that we should continue to talk, talk about, but that doesn't prevent us from moving forward with this item today. And then there was the discussion about transportation corridor and the impacts of traffic. I think it's unfair for us to hold this project up because there's concern about there not being a transportation corridor. It's like a chicken or the egg thing. If we create the type of community that we want, which is housing in more urbanized city centers that's walkable and bikeable, we can create a public transportation network that supports that infrastructure. But if we're saying, no, it just it's not there now, so we're not gonna do it, we're just more or less keeping things the same. Um, parking, I, I, Alan, I'm not gonna go too far in here because Alan, you nailed it on the head. We can't prioritize parking. To me, that is the worst um, public policy decision that we can make um, at the local level. We need to prioritize people. We need to prioritize housing. We need to house people, and that's the crisis. The crisis isn't parking. People will find alternative modes. We need to be part of that change to the culture in our community. Um, sea level rise, staff already spoke to some of those concerns and how we can mitigate that. Um, so to use that as an excuse for us not to look at this, um, we need to use this land. It's just sitting there and being used in a way that's not the priority for our community. Um, also, I think if we look at saying, hey, let's look at this when the water is available, maybe come back in five years, the costs are going to be higher then, and, and they're only going to increase, they're only going to continue to increase. So the sooner that we get on this, the sooner that we're able to, to support allowing these types of things to move forward, the better it's going to be for our community, the better it's going to be for taxpayers and less of an impact. And by the way, we still own this property. We're just going to be leasing it out to the developer. So eventually here, we might be able to generate some revenue from this. But if we keep kicking the can down the road, it's only going to make it more impossible for us to do these things in the future. And then the Garden Road was brought up. And I, I almost kind of want to ask staff, I'm looking at the city's site for the um, development projects, and it, it looks like it's been a while since it might've been updated, but I, as far as I understand, those projects on Garden Road are still moving forward. There's still some things that they're going through with the city, um, but those projects are moving forward. There were some additional housing opportunities that they were gonna do on two of those sites um, that were 100% affordable housing. Those aren't happening because of the water thing, but there's still housing moving forward on Garden Road. And I'm still hopeful, I don't know why, but I'm still hopeful deep down inside that uh, Brad Slama will find a way of trying to make something work. Uh, but nonetheless, I think that we can't say that it's not working because I, 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 the, the projects are still moving forward there. Um, and the water issue, the developer knows about that and they're willing to take this risk, still chomping at the bit for us to find a way of making this work. Staff just said, we're so close, we're almost there. So let's continue having that conversation with the water management district. Let's continue having that conversation with the community so we can meet that Delta. This will be my, my, my last point and, and just kind of ending on this water topic. Sitting on Monterey One Water for the city, we understand that the anticipated construction completion of the expansion project is expected to be completed in December of 2024. So I imagine soon after that, we're gonna have a water allocation. December 2024 is gonna be here before we know it. And if we waited until then, we wasted all this time to allow some of this red tape and this back and forth that should happen and needs to happen um, from happening. And we're just kicking the can down the road, making it a burden on future generations. Uh, uh, Mayor, I see uh, Alan's hands up, but I also have additional comments. Yes, I, I saw it. So since we're kind of doing a rotation, I just wanted to, if I may, 
just briefly discuss uh, another concept. As I said in my introductory remarks, that uh, we, we hear over and over and over and over again the need for workforce housing. I heard it when we met with MPC uh, interim superintendent I, and uh, PK with MPUSD, et cetera. And a lot of agencies are pursuing a housing for their workforce. And I'm suggesting that I think an element of any city property should be looking for city workforce housing because you know we're losing engineers. Um, it's The police department is a very competitive. And if we had the opportunity where people can come in and live in on city property, workforce property, just as they're having to do with teachers, to me, that's something I really would like to explore. And another element of that is home ownership, not a single family home, but any kind of home ownership. We have over 500 inclusionary houses in the city of Monterey. And people are still being able to purchase anywhere from three to 250 to $500,000 uh, home ownership. And we all know that that's a really important key to economic and social equity is some kind of home ownership, because that's the way that you can get ahead. That's the way that you can pass it on to your family. So I think those two elements of home ownership on city owned property with restrictions, as well as making city owned property for our workforce, something that I would think are very important and well worth looking into. So council member Allen and council member Dan, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I do have a question for staff and I have a question for you. Um, oh. So the question for staff had to do with the water and uh, kind of what I maybe heard Councilman Dan saying is let's not enter into this now until we've sorted out the water. And I guess my question to staff is, is that sort of like the resiliency thing? Is that something that would would come later or maybe even be part of the ENA itself in terms of negotiations with the developer? Um, so that's a question to staff. And my question to you, Mr. Mayor, is would you be willing to support this if we included a requirement that some of the um, units be allocated for city workforce housing? Um, so I don't necessarily know that we'd want to allocate all. I mean, we have about what, 300, 350, 360 city workers now. Certainly not all of them would need work or want workforce housing. Um, there are certainly some that would, but I think basically, I would also just note, I think city workers make more than, let's say, um, K-12 workers do. So I'm not sure that our need is as great as MPUSD's need, but I do acknowledge there is a need. So I wouldn't necessarily want to say all of it. I don't know how much, I think that's something the staff would have to look at, like how many of our city workers even are interested in this? Yeah. That's an unknown sure. and, 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 and would qualify in terms of low income. Mm -hmm. So, but I, but I would be open to including an amendment that would um, add that workforce, city workforce, affordable workforce housing element to this. If, if that would um, be important to you. So those are two questions, staff. You know, is the water something that really typically we'd have, we should, we should work out before we move forward? Or is that something that would be part of this ongoing conversation during the ENA? Okay, so we'll ask our very professional Hans Usler, our, our grant, would we, do we have an answer to that? Uh, Alan's question with respect to how does water play a yes. role in the ENA? Yes, we made it. Uh, the ENA clearly defines that finding the water is on the developer. Uh, they are required to uh, obtain all the necessary water for the project, and uh, that's part of, of our existing ENA. Uh, with respect to Council Member Harper's second question, uh, that uh, is, is um, the, the point of workforce housing. Uh, none of the city workforce will qualify for, for affordable housing on those sites. 
Uh, so uh, the the ENA and also the affordable housing developers they they are bound by the federal standards of income, mm. and uh, none of the city workforce will qualify for that. And for the same reason, let me throw in none of the teachers at MPUSD may qualify for that as as their superintendent uh, uh, um, informed me quite a while ago. Uh, because those uh, income levels are that low. So the point that I tried to make is if the council wants to uh, bring in some housing abilities for workforce, be it city of Monterey uh, workers, employees, or be it other public employees, uh, that will change completely the, the setup for those two ENAs that are in front of you because neither one of those two developers uh, will be able then to proceed and provide affordable housing. Lastly, uh, just just for 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 your information, both developers have uh, indicated that they will need financial uh, contributions also from the city in order to make those uh things pencil out consumer Hafer was talking about uh, seven hundred thousand dollars and that's the price of doing it and the the, the developer has to figure that one out there's still uh, there are still uh, small funding shortfalls right now they are small uh, as indicated by both developers um, uh, vanessa diffenbach is here maybe she can talk about this a little bit more uh, when we talk about madison street but uh, there, uh, there is some sort of the, the quiet expectations from our selected developers that in one form or another, the city will help out and uh, contribute uh, financially also to make the buildings pencil out. So I just wanted to add this into the mix as well because um, Council- So Hans, could I, could I get design, clarification? Uh, finance. So on this particular case then, really, Workforce housing is not on the table, is what you're saying. Not not for our employees or MPUSD employees, MPC employees, or other public agencies, no. And if we wanted to do that, we would probably have to pony up even more money to make it cost effective to replace the grant money that developers would lose from not making it affordable. Step yes, we would lose a lot of money uh, with that. And frankly, I would say I would then go to a private developer and say, what can you build for us? And what will that entail in order to, for you to pencil it out? Because uh, the private developers are not by that, I mean, not the affordable housing developers. Uh, they don't have access to the to all the grants that, that the affordable housing developer has. However, they, they have clear um, business models uh, in which they will tell us clearly what what they would expect as as market rate units and what they can offer us it could be also a model of home ownership uh, where they can sell certain units at, at market rate and and other deed restricted units that's a total new ball game but again the mid pen and first community housing they are more specialized in uh, in those affordable housing projects and know the way around and finding uh, tax credits and grant opportunities. Good. Uh, Council Member Dan, did you want to? Yeah, I did. Okay, thank you for your patience. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, so, um, Council Member Williamson brought up an inter interesting thing that I wasn't aware of. Maybe, maybe it is. Um, is this a land lease or are we giving the property to them? This is a ground lease. So the city retains ownership of the property. Okay. And and what is the, you have to negotiate what that land lease would be, right? Exactly. Otherwise. Okay. So let me get back to water then. Um, the only reason I brought that up is it sounds to me like the developer is going to have to work with the city anyway, or, or is he just work with the, the water district? Is the, the city involved at all? Uh, yes, the city is involved. Um, going back to May, uh, when Jeff presented on behalf of First Community, uh, they made it very clear they're eager to work on this project, but they need uh, the exclusive negotiating agreement, that um, certainty that the city is involved with them in a true partnership to keep spending their staff time, to keep having their architect work with it, their project manager working on this. So this um, is a show of good faith that we're here, we're partnering with them, uh, we're going to work with them and the water district on this issue. 
And so that's why this is that first step for them to keep working on the water. Okay, but they're, they're still gonna have to work with the city anyway. And then that was my point well, was that I'd like to see the city come back or our staff come back with, with whatever we're gonna do with the two meters or whatever, that yeah. just makes sense to me. But, and, and the last thing is, um, I know that uh, Clyde, you've been, you've been here a few years and you know, anytime a very large project enters our city, there's always negotiations about the size of the project. And usually that size is, um, is brought down to reality. I'll put it that way. Um, so I, I wanna make sure that the, the developer knows that. If he comes in with 65 units, thinking that it's gonna be five and six, and then finds out that there is pressure not to have that size, will he back out and say, I can't afford two stories or three stories? Because I mean, I, I just wanna make sure he understands that or she, whoever it is. <clears throat> yes, uh, Jeff's on the line tonight. He was on the line in May. Um, you know, we've certainly uh, relayed our staff experiences on development projects. So I think they're very clear eyed on this and um, they understand the challenges. Thank you. That's it, Mayor. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Any final comments? Someone, are we ready to try a motion? Council Member Ed? Yeah, just a, a couple of final comments and. Mm -hmm. you know, Ed. You know, I want to just start off by saying I appreciate uh, divergent opinions and Alan and Tyler, and I appreciate the cheesy analogy because this is the all-star game night and uh, yeah. and the baseball uh, assembly is very, very, very quick, Alan. Good job. <laughs> However, not everybody wants uh, a grand slam because I think that in the entertainment world, just like in uh, passing and approving uh, future projects. I know this is not a project, but we have to think in terms of who's going to cheer, who's going to appreciate it, who's going to use it, what's the impact. These are the tough things of policy that are having everything to do with land use. I participate in aspirational. I participate in applying experience and wisdom and, and say, hey, let's have an exercise in visionary. I mean, yeah, let's let's try and build some more units. But fundamentally, what gnaws at me is when we have two sides of the argument, and I and I hear it tonight, and I hear it frequently, but yet there's also these blinders that people don't want to admit that we have a water crisis, and the community has split over this. One side of the community doesn't want to desal. The other side of the community wants a desal. We want more additional water so that we can approve some projects. Aside from that, we can't solve that. That that hangs out there in the community with forces that are greater than us, as powerful as we think we are and as impactful as we think we are. We can't move the needle where it needs to be moved so we can see a result of additional water for approval of these projects. Aside from that, I don't see a point in getting into a relationship with a location that is incongruent with my core value, which is build it right, build it where it's gonna fit and where it's gonna have some purpose that also doesn't step all over somebody else that so there's winners and then there's losers and that's not good we want compatibility we want quality of neighborhoods we want good neighborhoods and we want neighbors to get along i'm not saying sacrifice housing for parking that wasn't my message my message is a neighborhood down the street where people just like you all have slaved to uh, save money and buy property and protect their neighborhoods and they appreciate their neighbors. But when we're talking about a six story building, a five foot, a five story building where you have a ballpark and, and yes, people go to the ballpark because it's an entertainment center, it's a recreation center and parking is inevitable. So that doesn't mean that I have a vision that we build everything where it's all density and Nobody can drive a car and they have to walk 
and they have to drive a bike. And I went to San Francisco two weeks ago and I'm struck with that's not where I want to live and that's not where I live. And I don't live in Monterey because I want to make it something that it's not. I want to honor what we have and find appropriate projects and appropriate land use and partnerships and compatibility. And when we see these projects, it's frustrating because we don't have the water. And many times when you just say, Alan, and I'm gonna say what you said was build it, build it, hit, hit it out of the park and think big. Well, that to me means you're willing to sacrifice somebody else's quality. I'm not there. And I don't think that's what you totally mean. I think you're looking for compatibility and right projects in the right place. And I think in that we agree. I just think this location doesn't accomplish that. And I don't see the purpose of spending city staff resources on something that inevitably gets us nowhere close to the end result, which is additional housing units. I just think it's got too many moving parts that are making it impossible to see an outcome. And for those reasons, I, I just don't, don't agree that that's the right place. Um, yes, if there's the right locations and we have some water, I'm in favor of some housing. I'm not cross purposes here, but my overriding goal is to protect Monterey and make sure we don't corrupt neighborhoods. And that neighborhood would be adversely impacted and I'm not willing to do that. But thank you for bearing with my responses. No, oh, well, all of us have really good, strong thoughts, opinions, caring and articulate. So it's a, it's a good, as usual, good, tough discussion. I appreciate the, everyone's uh, input and politeness and making their point so clearly. Mayor, so, if I may, Mayor? Yes, uh, is that Council Member Dan again? It's a little hard to pick up. This is it was Tyler. This is Tyler. Oh, Council Member Tyler. Sorry. Yeah. So I want to, um, and I want to start where 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 Ed ended, and and I want to give you appreciation, Ed. Um, as I stated in the past, I appreciate you coming to a a place where you're saying I don't see it. I don't want to waste our time. I appreciate that because I think that's important for me when I look at what we're the impact that we have on our staff and the work commitments that they have, the impact on the community. So I, I, I respect and appreciate that out of you. Um, I think where it creates a little bit of confusion for me is we went into this um, knowing the placement, right? This isn't, it's not like this is coming to us for the first time saying, okay, now we realize it's gonna be there. No, we've discussed this in closed session. We've released RFPs. And before we even released RFPs, staff came to us and said, hey, we looked at all city property. We got rid of sidewalks, you know, typographical, uh, um, uh, topography land that is not suitable for development, um, you know, current in use for, you know, designated purposes like the sports center. They got rid of all that. They gave us a list. There was five properties on there. Through that process, the council chose to remove one of them. And we said, let's move forward with the other four. And so if the issue is the, the location, then I'm confused on how we even got here in the first place because the council supported us getting here and staff using that time to release the RFP, work with developers and, and, and what have you. When we're talking about that, and, and maybe it wasn't fully realized, maybe we're seeing the image that the developer's providing us and it makes us a little bit scared. Maybe there's been conversation with some residents that have maybe helped formulate that position and feeling. Um, but I think how, as Alan alluded to earlier, this is in downtown. This is downtown Monterey. Everybody on the peninsula, everybody in the county sees city of Monterey downtown as the downtown for our region. And if this is not an area to do this, where where is that? Where is it? Um, and so I I I just I that's a values thing. I I I know I'm not necessarily going to change hearts and minds there for some. Um, you brought up 
a really good issue, which is something that we all often come back to, which is the water. Um, and I would just say in this without getting too long winded on this item, if if it plant panned out as is anticipated that in less than two years, we get an allocation from the water management district because of the expansion, what had what kind of impact that would that have had on this project moving forward when we could have said, well, I wish we did that then. But instead we're saying, nope, we don't have it now. There's this issue. We're going to bring this conflict and the realities that exist within there, which I don't think anybody is naive to. I think we all recognize that tension that exists um, and how that creates challenges for us to move forward on these things. But it is very, very likely that we will have a uh, additional water allocation from the water management district soon after the expansion is completed. So I think it would be a lost opportunity there. Um, Mayor, you had spoken to kind of home ownership and wanting to prioritize that. Mm -hmm. um, and then also the idea of working from housing and kind of revalidating that point. I think all I can say here is yes and. And I kind of, I, th I think I said that statement earlier and when I was speaking, but I just kind of want to re-emphasize that nothing is, it, it's, it's, these ideas aren't mutually exclusive. Nothing is saying that that can't happen, but we're not talking about that stuff right now. That's not what's in front of us. This is in front of us. Here's this opportunity. And so I think that's just kind of can be used as a, as a crutch. I think we can try to use that as a way to say no. And I just kind of want to find a way of being able to remove some of those barriers to get us to yes. Um, I, I would also point out that with our RENA allocation, there's, as time goes on, there's going to be a greater and greater um, expectation from the state. And we're seeing that happen now where they're going to start reinforcing the need for us to not only plan for the development of, but actually um, produce that, that housing. And so we're getting in our own way and we're creating um, problems for ourselves um, in, in conflict with the state. And it just brings up another point to me, which is local control. I'm, I'm down for local control. I'm down for us having the control. And this is that opportunity for us to control it. It's right here in front of us. But this is when the problem comes in and the state feels like they need to solve it. I don't want the state to come in and try to solve it. I want us to do it. But if we're not bold enough and creative enough and forward thinking enough to think about the impacts that this decision, which it seems like the direction it's gonna go in tonight is gonna to have on our community, well, no wonder why the state comes down to push further and greater mandates on this. This is, I'll end with this point. This is good for our entire community. This isn't just about poor people. This isn't about equity. This is a good thing for our entire community. You create a mix of housing. We need additional housing. We know the main thing that goes into this whole topic of housing um, is, uh, being able to create that, that varying degree, creating uh, additional supply in the market so it helps stabilize the cost of housing. And we're, we're basically saying, hey, let's not add to supply. Let's allow the cost of housing to continue to increase. Let's make it harder for our children and our grandchildren to be able to afford the cost of living here. Unless I have a lot of money and I can help them find a place of their own, or I'm okay with them living with me, or I die and they inherit my property. I mean, there's these limited circumstances that exist and a greater and greater number of our community members, um, or, of people that work uh, within our city um, are finding it increasingly difficult. And this is, it's, it's making it challenging to develop a true community where you can know your neighbors um, and be in support of one another. And, and I, I fear we're moving in a direction that's not doing that and sticking to those values. Um, Mayor, and, and Mayor, sorry, sorry. And with yeah. that, I'll make a motion to approve the staff recommendation um, so that the city council authorize the city manager to enter into an exclusive negotiating agreement with First Community Housing for 442 Adams Street. I'll second okay. the motion. I have a motion and discussion. Uh, uh, council Member Dan, uh, excuse me, Council Member Ed. Yeah, I just I just wanted to, um, you know, I appreciate Tyler giving the the history of how we got here, but you probably forgot. I did not support this when I lost the vote. The city's measure was not with my affirmative vote for the property of 442 Adams. 
So I was well aware of it. I was there. I participated. I voted against this property. And there's nothing I can do to stop it. It's coming with my without my vote. So I was fully engaged, and this was not a surprise. And it didn't get past me, nor did I get convinced to change my mind. Sure. I didn't vote to support this site because I felt back then it was the wrong site, just as I've articulated tonight. I think it's the wrong site. But there's so many things that we agree on. But in this initiative with this attempt, I just think I want to preserve as much inertia and effort as we can to get to the next project, because I think that's doable. We'll talk about that in a minute. But thank you for your patience. Right, Ed? Okay. That was it. Okay, was okay. I was just going to say the same thing, Ed, is that I remember you saying, I don't want this project. I, I remember that. So I just want to bring that up. <laughs> yeah. but, but a couple of things, um, not to belabor this, but um, we're talking about land use. The city has decided many, many years ago that that was going to be a play field there where thousands and thousands and thousands of youth every year come down to play. Yeah. And if we decide that that is going to be a park and it's always going to be a baseball park, then it needs support in some way. Yeah. And I'll tell you, people are not going to walk down to that park. They're going to drive down with their kids. So at, with Ed saying, and I, and I understand about the parking, it needs parking. So if we take the parking away from the park, then what are we going to do with the people, thousands of people that come down there? So maybe the solution is making sure that the, the this this developer understands that and maybe has some solution for parking at that park. See what I mean? So, I mean, that, if he can come up with an idea that, that balances that, where, okay, we have parking for the park and we also have housing. Well, well good. That balances everything, folks. So I understand what you're saying, Alan, about, uh, uh, about hitting a home run, but once again, we can't, as, as Ed said, we can't just, we have to validate the people that are living here right now yes. and owning homes. But on the other hand there, there is a balance because there are other people that want homes here yeah. and, and we have to look at them too. So well, what about the parking garage on Franklin Street that's underutilized? And isn't that part of the solution? Is it underutilized? Yeah. Okay. And and I would just that could be part of the solution. Alan. Well, and and I would just add, Dan, if we don't support the ENA tonight, we're not going to be able to work with the with the developer to see if parking in that site would be even an option. Good point. Um, I I just I think that the parking garage is always an option because it's walkable. But when when you're going to a ball field and you've got two kids with all the equipment, you're, you, people are not going to unload equipment and walk two and a half blocks at eight o'clock at night to go to the ball game. It just, that doesn't happen anywhere. And and I think that that has long existed as a primary site of recreation. And uh, I don't wanna lose the flavor of that, but you know, we've already talked about all the issues. There's, there's lots of combinations, there's lots of little solutions, but uh, sometimes you have to back away and say, hey, this is a, a round hole we're trying to put a square peg into it and it's just not for me it's just not worth the time i appreciate the the time jeff and his company has already put in it but i would rather he spend some place and time with somebody that he's going to have a second date and with me it's not it <laughs> i don't want to give you a zirconian diamond <laughs> i want to i want it to be a real, real since a real deal real sincere <laughs> partnership and i can't give you that i i, I need a water plan that's what I need. Well, and All I right. I, I think everyone's expressed themselves uh, very articulately. One sentence, Mayor. I, I would just say, as I've said several times, if not here, then where? So if we're going to de deny this one, then I hope that folks are willing to have the leadership to step forward and bring that thing that is going to work for us because we need to do that. We need to do something. Yeah. Doing nothing is not the option. Well, Tyler, thanks for that. I would, it just reminds me, I want to praise this entire council. All It was a 5-0 vote to rezone and increase densities and heights in East Downtown. It was a 5-0 vote to rezone and try to get Garden Road um, rezoned, which we did. 
It was a 5-0 vote to write the water management district and the state of California for relief and additional water, 70 acre feet, I think we were talking about to make uh, Garden Road happen. Yep. And, and another source of housing, I appreciate Tyler, you bringing that up. Again, there are institutions that have a lot of land. The, the school district is a really good example. And so I, I think the potential there is huge as well. And you have a lot of private owners who have a lot of unused land, commercial buildings that are sitting there with water credits. I think there are opportunities to build housing and I support all of it just as this council has. So shall we, let's take a roll call vote, please. All right, council member Williamson. Yes. Council member Hoffa. Yes, home run. <laughs> Council Member Albert? No. Council Member Smith? No. And Mayor Roberson? No. Let's take a break, come back at 920 and we'll take a look at our, our next property, please. We'll see you in 10. It
I haven't heard we're recording. We're still recording. Oh, okay. Never yeah, stopped. Yeah, it didn't stop. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's get on to item 24. Authorize the city manager to enter into an exclusive negotiating agreement with MedPin Housing for development of affordable housing at 587 and 593 Van Buren Street. Without further ado, we'll turn it over to Hans to introduce this and his excellent staff, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Grant, take it away. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, as with the previous uh, presentation, we'll do a, a quick three or four slide presentation here about the other ENA we're discussing, which is with MidPen for the City Hall site. And these four addresses behind City Hall. Um, just real quick for any new people who may have joined us from the public, uh, the city continues to have a shortage of affordable housing units while receiving uh, mandates from the state to develop more housing. Uh, to be proactive on this, in 2020, the city released a request for proposals for four city-owned properties to be developed as 100% affordable housing. Those were received in October of 2020, and staff has been negotiating with two uh, affordable housing developers since 2021, in February 2021, on exclusive negotiating agreements. And in May of this year, uh, City Council directed staff to finalize those and bring them back, which is what we have done tonight. Here are the summary of the key terms for this property. Uh, it would be 36 units, all affordable, three stories. It would be a mix of low-income units between 30% of the area median income all the way up to 60%. In response to public comment, I have a, a slide after this that explains in real dollar terms what those are. Uh, it would be a 240-day term with a one-year extension. Um, city and the developer would be willing to work with the city on a local preference policy so that people who live and work in the city would have the first bite at the apple for any affordable housing that's built there. Uh, no funding commitments, any um, budget issues and cost sharing agreements would come at a later date to the council to consider and approve. Uh, but the developer would have full access to the site to begin working on pre-development studies. Uh, this is a rendering from the initial proposal, which showed a two-story design. Uh, this will be updated to show a three-story design but you get the, the concept um, and the general features, which look similar to the Van Buren Senior Housing, which is one block away, which was also built by Mid Penn Housing Corporation. So uh, to break down the jargon a little bit, um, the Department of Housing and Urban Development at the federal level and the state Department of Housing and Community Development issues average income for different areas, typically by the county and they do this annually and for monterey county this is what those two agencies have determined would be low income for monterey county so if you make sixty plus sixty three thousand dollars seven hundred and you're a single person you would be considered low income in monterey and a family of four earning ninety one thousand dollars would be considered low income so um you know definitely minimum wage Workers qualify as this, uh, all the way up to entry-level professionals, and then um, you know your low-income married couple or a family of four trying to make it on ninety-one thousand. Uh, Grant, before you leave that, in an earlier discussion, we were talking about would school teachers and uh, city workers qualify as low income? But uh, Dan can help me. But I think the starting salary in MPUSD is it. Is it above 45,000 yet? Is yeah, it if, if I remember straight, it's about, well, when I left, it was about 54. 54. So we did have a discussion a little bit about workforce housing and would teachers or uh, entry level city employees, would they qualify? And it looks like there's certainly a chance that they would, just to point that out. Yes, certainly by the numbers. Uh, it's important to point out that workforce housing is often thought of as employer sponsored housing, like a farm or provide farm worker housing or a hospital might be right. housing. So uh, 
anyone applying for this would have the same equal opportunity to apply. It wouldn't be restricted to a certain employer. Exactly. Thank you. But I, I just thought it was interesting. People don't just don't realize that somebody with a master's degree, 54,000, and I'm not saying poor teachers, it applies to almost everybody. Then you take out 25% uh, taxes. Uh, and in many cases, uh, unfortunately, there's uh, sometimes health insurance is paid for, certainly very, not too often, but even with teachers, they're taking another 500 to a, a thousand a, a individual out for health. They're not left with a whole lot of money, folks. They are qualified for low income. And what a sad commentary on our country that teachers are low income people. Go ahead. Mr. Mayor, before you go on, I, I also note that the the custodian staff, the secretaries, they're all gonna qualify under that. Yeah. And uh, even at MPC, half of our professors are non-permanent professors. Mm -hmm. All of those make less, way less than $60,000 a year, probably more like 40,000. Yeah, with a master's that, or a PhD. So they would all qualify. Yeah, yeah but thank you for that. Just throw in, Mr. Mayor, keep in mind if uh, they are single, right? So if, if you have a married couple, they easily and both work, um, they, they they may fall out of that. So I just wanted to add No, that. of course, it, it's, it's, it's all a very individual without question. But then you don't necessarily have two incomes. Then a baby comes along and somebody stays home. I mean, that's... We could we could go down that trail forever. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you, Grant. I just wanted to make my point. Uh, thank you. Um, and just to to clarify, so I don't cause any confusion, this is the limits for eighty percent. Uh, what's proposed in the ENA is sixty percent, so it would be under this. This is just for a point of reference. Got it. Thank you for that. Yeah, good point. Uh, so the next steps would be to proceed with. Uh, if this is approved tonight, proceed with pre-development studies uh, to work with our developer and the water management district to ensure that the, the site has adequate water and the city can transfer its credits to it, and to continue to advocate for more water credit allocation for affordable housing, and then finally to negotiate the development agreement. And with that, we can go to questions and discussions, and we also have um, a member of the development team here from MidPen. Okay, thanks so much. Questions uh, for the council before we go to public comment? Yeah, I have a question. Yes, please, Council Member Dan. So is it too early to ask the question of how someone qualifies except for um, obviously for the the uh, salary, but but how do they how do they choose people that go into this this uh, facility? How, how does that work? Uh, well, it varies with the developer, but typically you would open it up for an application period, create a wait list. Um, you know, first come, first serve, provided you meet the income qualifications. And, and it mentioned that they were looking at local preferences. Does local mean the city of Monterey, or does it mean the Monterey Peninsula, the county? What does that mean when you say local preferences? Right. As, as we discussed in May, uh, local preferences. I don't remember. I know. Uh, just to refresh, um, what was discussed in May is a local preference policy where you would prioritize people who live and work within the city. The city of Monterey. Uh, but there's a process to make sure that that doesn't violate her fair housing law. So um, that's a lengthy process that would go through. And again, the reason why we don't make this uh, workforce housing is because of the, the funding source that um, only allows you to be fair in choosing the people that go in there, I assume. Correct. Okay. All right, that's it. It's the only questions I have. Uh, I have a quick question, uh, Grant. Yes, please. You showed, you showed the you showed the list on under uh, a model of eighty percent AMI. Um, who decides what the level is going to be versus sixty percent? Because we were looking at eighty percent, but this is scoped as possibly being sixty percent, which means. Um, the chart we looked at is not really the chart that we would be using as a guideline. So, but how do we decide whether it's 60% or whether it's an 80% AMI? Right. Uh, the chart was just for reference to get a, a flavor of what qualifies as low income. Uh, the developer MidPen proposed a mix of 30%, 50%, 60% AMI. 
And that goes back to their funding strategy as well. You qualify for different tax credits and grants, et cetera, depending on which population you serve. And, and is it true that the, the lower income scales actually benefit them in finding available funding sources for low income? And therein lies the sliding scale of finding the right amount and the sources of the funding based on the makeup of the occupants based on what rents they're going to pay. Uh, correct. It goes back to the funding strategy of pursuing vouchers, pursuing state grants, pursuing veterans housing. There's a there's an art and a science to it that they're very good at. Yeah. yeah. Um, and side note, this is the same developer, as you've mentioned, that's developed the Van Buren property across the street. Part of that one was um, there was other buildings to take down and prepare the site. Mm -hmm. Certainly have knowledge here. Would this ENA include the cost of demolition of our city properties? That would be part of their package, and there would be no cost to the city for demolition of the existing properties that are on these sites. Uh, this is, is just a negotiating agreement. Um, you know, it gives them access to the site for pre-development. Mm -hmm. As I mentioned before, it does not have any costs uh, sharing in it. So if they have a budget request, a cost sharing request, that'll come back as a separate consideration for the council. Okay, thank you. All right, let's go to the public, please. Let's find anyone in the council chambers, uh, Nat? No, Mr. Mayor. All right, how about online? Yes, we do have Esther Malkin with her hand raised. All right. Um, Esther? Uh, I, 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 I'm like beyond words, I swear. Sometimes I watch these council meetings and I'm just flabbergasted. I can't wait to see what comes out of saying, you know, building this kind of stuff is going to corrupt neighborhoods. Hello? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. It, yep. it kept coming up on mute, on mute, on mute, and I was unmuted. So if you could add some, thank you. So thank you, Grant, for doing that chart, but it would have been more useful as pointed out by the council members, if it had been in the 60% as opposed to the 80% um, AMI chart, because then it would really show the level of poverty that you have to be living in to qualify for any of these. And a reminder that it took 12 years to build 18 units at, at the senior housing in Van Buren. And I recall at the time there was an, a thousand people on that wait list. So that's what we're up against as well. So. I, I strongly suggest that the, the council understand what AMI means because your city staff and, and other than your executive staffs and the teachers you claim to be wanting to, to afford these units cannot afford these, these, these units. They're not going to qualify. That is why the problem that we're having now is workers are leaving because they're not qualifying for anything the few things that are available and or they are becoming homeless if they want to stay in the jobs that they have that aren't paying them enough and I, homeless doesn't mean you're unsheltered homeless means you don't have a home so the next step from not having a, a place to to shack up with somebody is for you to live in your car or the street or leave so if anybody cares about homelessness prevention, you guys better start thinking about affordable rents because you guys have not come up with any alternative sites to what you're, you're denying now because you don't wanna corrupt some neighborhoods. It's mind boggling truly to hear these kind of comments. And I'll remind you that the only reason that you guys spent any time talking about ADUs was because the state said you had to, or they would come in and do it for you. The same is going to happen here. More than likely, when very few of you that are sitting on that council right now will still be around, but this local control, you would be smarter to use it now in a way that it will 
show the state that you actually tried to do something on your own, because just like with the ADUs, that is what's going to happen. It already has happened with SB9. That's going to be how you are going to meet your arena numbers. You haven't come up with a single alternative to get to those numbers who not only doubled, but tripled. How do you propose to even come up with a fraction of those numbers? It is mind boggling that when you have the opportunity to even just do projects like this for the super low income, even if you accept that you're gonna lose middle income people that can't live here, you won't even do this to meet your RENA numbers. What are your alternatives as a council to, to, to these properties? I, I just don't find any solution if you're going to dig in like we just saw and say that you don't want to corrupt neighborhoods and parking is going to be more important than housing people. It's mind boggling. I, I, you guys are going to get a lot of blowback about this. The majority of the residents in the city are renters and we should not be treated like this. Thank you. And next we have Max Troyer. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak. Uh, my name is uh, Max Troyer. I am a recently appointed uh, director at large of the Old Town Neighborhood Association to replace Bob Grimes, who recently passed away. He was a, yeah. a long-term director and former president of the OTNA organization. Um, one of the things that um, we're very excited about is the uh, potential to maybe create a playground uh, along with this affordable housing uh, redevelopment of the, the four parcels. Um, we've been trying to create a playground for many years. Um, we lost access or neighbors lost access to the, the, the Larkin Park when the Bayview Academy was awarded the use of the only um, OTNA neighborhood park during uh, school hours. Um, and we see a real, a real real potential in working uh, in partnership with the city to create uh, an opportunity for the residents of the neighborhood as well as the residents of the future uh, development. Clearly, uh, parking is, uh, as an, is, a, is an important issue and there are currently uh, parking lots behind Colton Law, uh, behind, behind Colton Hall, uh, and as well as the police and fire department uh, parking lots. There's a lot, there's a lot in play in that area with potential to create some um, some additional underground parking or a parking to garage in one or other of those parking lots. Um, parking, any additional parking created could be uh, fantastic for the Monterey High School uh, night games, uh, since parking is sometimes a concern in the neighborhood when those uh, those games happen. Um, we also think any, any development of an affordable um, apartment complex ha has to take into consideration some some green space and a park would uh, be fantastic for that purpose parks and recreation is right there and it would be great to create some kind of you know modern inclusive uh, playground just to to welcome the uh, the, the kids um, I have four young kids right now um, by the time uh, this apartment building is built and and that potential park is built they will be in high school or in college but I still think it's it's very important. Uh, to to maybe seize this opportunity, um, I can be reached at um, the old oldtownmonterey.org website or my email address is max.troyer at oldtownmonterey.org. Uh, and we've got a committee. We're going to uh, flesh out a proposal um, just to see how it can fit in. But we're very excited about this uh, this development, and uh, I think it will be a great opportunity for folks who work uh, and live here in Monterey. Thank you. Thank you. And um, next, let's hear from a phone caller with the last three digits, 204. Please unmute yourself. There you go. Uh, good evening, uh, Tom Raleigh and uh, Fisherman's Flats. Uh, happen to be the president of the association. I'm also a realtor by, pre by uh, pr profession. And uh, we've been following what's happening at closing the Foothill School because of lack of students from the neighborhood and been following the developments along Garden Road. And um, 
what I'm concerned about is focus. Um, we see um, four, three of the four projects along Garden Road are actually under development. And I believe the, the count of u total units currently authorized under the water authorized is 140. I would like to suggest that the focus be given on this Madison Avenue project, not cry over spilt milk on the parking lot across from Jack's Ballpark. That needs to be put on the back burner. We need to follow through on the projects we've got and the ones that are realistic under the water that's available now. I think it was a waste of energy by the city staff. I, I disagree totally with the mayor's thing about, yeah, you did it unanimously. You threw a, threw a, a request, State Water Resources Control Board. Those of us that have been watching water for 40 years knew that that was going to be turned down. Uh, the thing is, you need to focus on things that are doable. And the project behind City Hall does have some water whether you can come up with enough water to build a project or a couple of projects or whatever, that's where the focus needs to be. Our staff, it's stretched. We don't need to waste time on projects that are not gonna happen. Familiar, the Eddy site, with building and interest rates were low. That's not been completed. I mean, there's other projects that are in the works that the uh, inflation and the cost of building costs and everything going up is going to affect on it. We're apparently entering a period of stagnation economically. It's going to take a while. We need to not be gambling on things that are not likely to happen in the, in the next one to two years. We need to sort out the water. We need to stay focused. And I think the decision to uh, kill the um, parking lot uh, project was the right one. And to move forward with this project is absolutely the right one and the one that the staff should focus on. Thank you very much. Thank you. And um, next, let's hear from a telephone caller with the last three digits of 772. Go ahead. Hi, this is Nancy Soule. I'm also with Old Town Neighborhood Association. I'm the secretary. And I just wanted to reiterate and support Max Troyer's idea there for trying to put a small neighborhood park within this complex. It would give some outdoor space. If, if water was an issue on lawn, it could perhaps be done without, uh, with a play surface that would allow uh, it not to be watered, you know, with more of a desert landscape type of thing. But um, your design, it, the Van Buren Senior Housing Project was nice. This one has a nice design to it, but the underground parking is going to be critical for it, not just for the what's, what is um, needed for um, the the staff who is currently, you're probably right now parked in that same lot right there, but um, for the amount of units, you've got 36 units, you're probably gonna have 50 or 60 cars based on those units and there is no parking on Madison Street in that block, nor the block above it on that side of the street, nor the block above, the, above Larkin on that side of the street. So parking is extremely difficult, you can't park um, on most of the areas there or with just, you know, hour or two parking restrictions. So please do plan in the parking, but try to consider that an underground parking garage could be a real good solution to try to help alleviate okay. what that would be coming to. Um, thank you for your consideration. We look forward. I know Max has got some great ideas and people there within our Old Town Association that would love to help you kind of with these designs. Thank you for your consideration. Good night. And there are no further hands raised on our Zoom call, Mr. Mayor. Okay, and thank you, Nancy, for your comments. And we'll have to explore a little bit. I thought we had an agreement with uh, the school district with respect to the old Larkin School. But so, uh, I'll, we'll, we'll chat offline on that one. But it's my understanding there may be somebody in the council chambers who wanted to speak. Yes, we do, Mr. Mayor, and she's here. Okay.
I think we need the microphone turned on or something. Oh, sorry about that. I'll no, start. hey, hello, welcome. Good evening, Mayor. Good evening, Council. My name is Vanessa Diffenbaugh. I'm a project manager for Midpen Housing. I think you probably all know me by now. I do live right up the street and have come right. to every meeting. I think that this has been on the agenda. So thank you for bringing it back and for having a vote, I hope, tonight. Um, I'm here to ask, answer any questions that you have, but I think I just wanted to sort of reiterate what we're here to do, which is just to um, hopefully uh, give direction to sign an ENA. And the purpose of the ENA really is just to continue to develop our partnership, developer and city together to create a vision for this property that we all agree is a great vision for this community. And I think that's one of the benefits of working with an affordable housing uh, developer. We take um, the, the vision and the mission of our work really seriously. And that's why we're coming um, to offer our support and services for this project. Mm -hmm. um, part of that developing the vision will be solving problems like water, bringing in all the necessary um, partners and organizations to get over those hurdles. Um, and what the ENA really allows is for us to have the commitment from this council that if we come up with a project that we all agree is a great vision for this community and that we can finance, that we, you as a council will move that forward to the next stage, which is the DDA. And that's where we'll really get into the nuts and bolts of exactly how many units are at exactly what income and how will people be selected um, and all of those really nitty gritty details. But this is just your commitment that if we can come up with the project, come up with the financing, solve all these problems that really are real in Monterey, um, then we have a project that everyone's excited to move forward. So I'm here if you have questions. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. <clears throat> No other okay. comments from the public, Mr. Mayor. All right, we'll close the public comment section of this discussion and back to the council. I'd like to make a motion to approve. Second. Under All discussion, right. I, I did want to, if, if it's okay, Mr. Mayor, just of briefly address the, the comments from the public. Um, so 100% support the idea of getting a playground in the old town neighborhood. Mm -hmm. I do have some concerns about this particular site just because it's not a very big site. Right now we're looking at pot, the possibility of a three-story building that would have 36 units, but anything else that you put there, you're gonna be reducing the number of units. And we've already reduced the number of units we could build in the city by reducing the number of sites we're looking at tonight. So. Um, but I do think there's other possibilities. There's a parking lot I, that the city owns. I can't remember if it's Roosevelt. It's basically on the other side um, near Miss on Van Buren. And is that Roosevelt? I can't that's, remember. That's uh, Jefferson. Jefferson. Thank you. I mean, maybe that site. I don't know. To me, that's a really small kind of undersized yeah. parking lot. Maybe that could be um, a kind of, you know, mini mini park um, playground. I don't know, but I but I but I but I would have some concerns about reducing the buildable space, and especially also if we're going to be putting in parking. There are a lot of things. Then these things will kind of all be hashed out when we get further into into negotiations uh, with the developer, and. And we'll continue to have conversations with the community, but um, like parking, for example, building a, an underground parking garage, very, very expensive. Sounds great in theory, would love to see it happen, but that could, that could make it unaffordable or the city mm -hmm. might end up, end up having to kick in money for that. On the other hand, you could have kind of ground floor parking and build above, but then you'd have to be perhaps be willing to push the height up an extra story. And so I don't know whether the neighborhood would be okay with that. But those are all things that mm -hmm. will be discussed with the community, with the council, with the developer over many, many, many meetings um, in the future. Yeah, anyone, uh, other council comments? Uh, yeah, Mayor, if I can dive into this. Yes, please. Yeah, I, I, I like this project and uh, <clears throat> I don't want to go back and Back into the water on the last one. But this one's we can't hear Ed. Ed, can you turn your mic on? 
uh, it's on now, and may, maybe sometimes people don't want to hear me. But <laughs> thank you. Uh, we would I, never say that, Ed. No, no, that's okay. Uh, <laughs> but it's the, it's there's a funny story. I'll I'll make it brief. But uh, what they really say about you when you leave the room that's that's the always unknown unknown story. Right. I like this project <laughs> because I've been looking at the dilapidated buildings across the mm. for years. I know we've been waiting for the right project. Uh, I, I know going way back, we thought it was going to be a civic center expansion. Uh, I'm glad we didn't go that route. You know, things have changed. We've got the available space. There's, you know, water on the site. Um, I think we need to get to this partnership. I've got a zirconian diamond that I'm ready to present to you, Vanessa. <laughs> and, and maybe there's a real diamond waiting. Um, <laughs> Uh, and metaphorically, uh, I think it's a great analogy that, you know, we want to continue with a partnership to see what this can become. I also really like the fact that this is 240 days to say, yeah, let's start, let's tabletop it, and then we're going to make a decision, and then we add a year. I like the fact that it's not this well, one year, and then another year, and then a third year. To me, this just seems like we have a partner who's earnest track record they know the the site they know the location they know the streets they know how to do this and uh, demo the buildings and get something done relatively soon there isn't a lot about this that i don't like except for i wished it was a tiny bit bigger because we could go to 40 units in a top lot or if it was bigger we could go to 50 and you know so obviously you you can't make up ground that's not there but uh with some creative um minds much more creative than me and with neighborhood collaboration i think we should be able to land on a very very nice project that will be there for many many years i do kind of have one question uh from staff that i forgot about there is one building that's up there next to the very large cypress tree that overlooks the parking lot it's one story it used to be used as a, a break room is that part of the property that goes with these four addresses uh, it is. It is still a break room. I wash my lunch plate there four days a week, and uh, unfortunately, we'll be losing that as part of this project. Okay, so I, I do then call for the you know the question of when you displace a building, <clears throat> displace the location where we have our garbage dumps or our, yeah. our receptacles. Yeah. We have a little tiny bit of parking there, so it does change the. The feeling of our front yard of the city building so i think we we also have to incorporate well what do we do about those sites that use where does it get displaced so this is not just you know tear it down and build it and they were all just great there are some details and i i love mm -hmm. that, this comment that once we get through this then we get into the nitty-gritty i like the nitty-gritty to get mm -hmm. done and i like the clarity and, and I like the location, so I, I'm going to support this. And uh, this is the kind of place that I think if we could find more like this, where there's water already on the site, it's much easier for me to say yes. And so I just want to say I, I like this one. And this is one that I started voting from the beginning that I was in favor of. Um, and that's all. Yeah, thanks, Ed. I think that that's really good for you to point out that it's uh, you just don't scrape and build. They're, they're, what do you do with the, the trash, the compactors? And also, you're right next to Colton Hall and also some other uh, City Hall adobes. So it's a very significant historical site. So going forward, MedPid did such a great job on the other Van Buren housing that absolutely fit into the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So I know they're going to be sensitive about Colton Hall the Underwood Adobe, where the city manager's office is. So we have to be really uh, sensitive there. Other comments? Yes, Mayor, I'll say something. So um, when I was um, employed by MPUSD, we looked at workforce housing on our mm -hmm. own sites. And um, it just was such a natural for us to build um, workforce housing uh, where teachers and administrators and custodians and and um, food workers could be right there on site. So for me, it's I understand it would be so nice. Maybe that's just a pipe dream, but it'd be so nice if this site was available 
uh, for um, uh, city employees because they're right here. It just seems like such a natural, just like MPUSD looked at it. But I understand that sometimes those, those dreams uh, have to give way to uh, more practical dreams. And that is uh, a company that, or a, uh, a developer that, that obviously has shown that they can do the job, just look down Van Buren and um, that that will get done. And of course, naturally, uh, for me, it's it's about the water and there is water there. So I can definitely support this project and I and I look forward to uh, uh, seeing uh, seeing what direction it goes. So good. Thank you. Other comments? Yeah, I'll, I'll just um, take a moment to celebrate because <laughs> I learned a lesson um, a while ago that we should all take every moment we can to celebrate. So I, I'll take this moment to 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 do that and um, and say how excited I am for there being this opportunity to move forward and knowing that we have a reliable developer, nonprofit developer that we've worked with in the past. As you mentioned, Mayor, um, just super appreciative of of the effort and look forward to the partnership. So thank you so much. Thank you for that comment, Tyler. Yeah. All right, so I, I think we would be ready for roll call. All right, Councilmember Albert. Yes. Councilmember Williamson. Yes. Councilmember Smith. A home run, yes. Councilmember <laughs> Council Hoffa. Yes. And Mayor Roberson. Yes, I knew that home run was going to, that baseball analogy was going to come back and haunt you, Alan. <laughs> That's great. Uh, you can't hey. lose with baseball. <laughs> Okay, let's go to uh, council comments. I'll share with you a little later our water management district uh, meeting, but let's find out what people have been doing at their outside meetings. So anyone want to start, please? Yeah, I'll start. Okay, sure. Councilmember member Dan. So I'm sure that you read the news in the paper that um, M MST received a $25 million grant uh, for their surf project, which is the bus line along Highway 1 that will yeah. really alleviate traffic, which is, uh, we're really excited about. On top of that, we got 1.8 million uh, from a, a bill that uh, was passed by, uh, with the help of uh, Senator Laird. So, um, as you read in the paper, we're about 85% uh, there, and mm -hmm. we're hoping that a couple more grants will we'll be able to ready to roll on this uh, project, which is really exciting. Um, the second item is that um, even though on Fourth of July. I mentioned uh, how proud I was of this uh, of our staff for putting on such a great a great backyard party, and um, it's just something that the city of Monterey is famous for, and we get a lot of people from uh, outside the peninsula to come, and it's just a showcase for the city of Monterey. So thank you very much. With I know there wasn't as much staff as there been in the past, uh, but um, it was just wonderful to see uh, that. Uh, happen for all the residents and the visitors. And then the last one I, I wanted to, to mention is that I worked with a superintendent, uh, named, his name was Dr. Jim Harrison, who passed yeah. away recently. He was a 17 year superintendent and he was probably the one of the most caring educators mm -hmm. that I ever worked with, mentor to everyone. And um, I, I, he went through a lot in his 17 years. He closed schools, yeah. uh, he had, Prop 13 he had to go through, and then the, the closure of, um, of uh, Fort Ord, and he did it with class and uh, respect, and I just have so much respect for the, for the man. So if we could, Mayor, I'd like to close this, uh, uh, this, this meeting in memory of Jim Harrison, if we could, Dr. Jim Harrison. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Councilmember Allen, any uh, council comments tonight? Yeah, just um, I've shared this with you, Mr. Mayor, but I don't know that the rest of the council has heard. Uh, Community Human Services, which as you know, um, purchased a property on Franklin Street um, for the mm -hmm. purposes of building a shelter for um, women and families. Um, recently was able to get um, help from our Senator John Laird uh, to help fund the renovation of that property. So it's a very expensive project, you know, to mm -hmm. take a building and completely renovate it, and yes. turn it into housing. Um, and uh, 
through Senator Laird's efforts, um, we'll be getting a two and a half million dollar grant to help with that um, with that purpose. So there's still going to be the need for other, you know, charitable donations um, mm -hmm. and support uh, to 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 complete the renovation, and then of course to support the operations. So there'll be opportunities for folks in the community who care about that issue of um, helping folks um, in need who need shelter. And again, in particular, this one um, will serve women and families. But uh, Senator Laird really came through and that's gonna make a big difference. That's great to hear, thanks. Council Member Tyler, any outside agencies and info you'd like to share with us? So um, first, I talking about celebration. Um, this weekend is Monterey Peninsula Pride. And so I just like to invite everybody to come out and enjoy because every year, if you have attended, you, you would know, but if you haven't, I, I'd encourage you to attend or ask folks that have attended. It is nothing but just a lo love filled event. People there enjoying themselves, um, having a good time, enjoying being with community. Um, and we're super excited this year because this is the first year we'll be doing a public event um since the pandemic started mm -hmm. and um and just super excited and, and and i won't go into all the reasons why this is so important um some probably more obvious than others but yes saturday is the celebration in the in the parade um that will go down um elvarado street and in the, in the celebration portion will be um in custom house plaza um so i think the parade kicks off at 11 and mm -hmm. then celebration portion starts at 12 in custom house plaza and it goes until three o'clock. And then um, there's gonna be an after party at uh, Pearl Hour on Lighthouse that starts at seven. And mm. then Sunday, there's gonna be an after pride panel discussion at Way Street Studios. So lots of festivities happening this weekend and just encourage folks to come out and, and, and join us and, and um, celebrate your, your queerness if you're part of the community or stand with us as ally, um, it's gonna be fun. Um, and in regards to my outside appointment, I, uh, if folks don't know, I sit on Monterey One Water, representing the city there. Um, and Hans, we've talked about this um, leading up to it, and, and I, I forgot to mention it to you in our in our update. But um, the um, Flores family has a project on Casanova. Um, it's multiple um, properties, kind of all together on Casanova there. And they have two wells on their site that they wanna to use to develop housing. Um, so it's really great in the context of the conversation that we're having today, because we have developers that are looking at trying to make a project happen within the city of Monterey. But the challenge is, is that um, the water is a little bit brackish. It has, um, mm. uh, gosh, I forgot what the terms are called. The prime it's, it's tds uh total dissolved solids yeah um and it's at higher levels than what um mon monterey one water staff was willing to accept so they denied their request but their request was was to allow them to put that brine and tds solids um into monterey one water manhole and let it come to our to the monterey one water plant um for recycling but there's an issue because how we um how we trans, how that water, how much it is um, uh, cleaned, it, it goes to the ag fields. So if it has too many salts in it, it affects the ag industry. And of course we wanna be sensitive to, to those issues um, on the peninsula. Um, but all this to say, um, I, I got support from all my colleagues on um, Monterey One Water to support, um, approving the request of the developer to move forward with this. And I'm just super excited to remove, again, that red tape, that ba those barriers that get in the way of, of, of us moving forward um, with creating housing. And, and, and I'll, I'll say part of the deal was for them to get off of the wells as soon as there is a water supply available and an allocation that they can tap into mm -hmm. so that it's not a long-term issue for Monterey One Water as an agency, but it is something that we can do in the short term to 
um, allow these developments to move forward. So super excited to, to report that out with you all today. Thank you so much and your service and council member Ed. Yeah, thank you. Um, and Tyler, I appreciate you sharing that because that is a significant story that needs to be told about somebody in the private sector who's willing to do a whole lot of extra to make this work. And and there's so many cases like that that, you know, the, the cost to build and the lack of the resources holding us up. So uh, we appreciate every effort where we have someone who has an idea and a dream and maybe some property and initiative to, to come forward. And we know that there's a lot of those conversations that are centered around uh, resources. So we look forward to future opportunities as we can get resources to be able to match the projects. Uh, I just wanna say that uh, typically July is uh, kind of an off month for all the agencies that I represent this council with, uh, TAMSI and AMBAG. Uh, and so I've saved a lot of time uh, with those meetings. Uh, a lot of meetings in August to make up for that. Uh, <laughs> I wanted to say that, um, you know, in spite of that, I've been still busy uh, with grandkids and visits. And I'd be remiss if I did not say that next week will be my uh, daughter's birthday, Amy. I'm not going to say her age, but, <laughs> um, you know, a, a very significant event for us was having Amy um, Smith Bay and um, has brought us two grandchildren. So happy birthday, Amy. Also, I wanted to say uh, yesterday I had, I had the uh, opportunity to meet with a very good friend of mine in a Drove District 2. And uh, I know District 2, and that's, you know, as you know, the next election coming up in November, we have uh, district elections and we have geographical areas that we will have responsibility for and uh, District 2. Uh, I won't bore you, but I'll encourage anybody that's watching, they're curious to please go to the, the city website and uh, look for the district to be able to learn and see that. Driving the district was exciting because I realized how fun and diverse and vibrant and active uh, the district is. And I counted last night as I was looking and saying, okay, what's in it? A lot of houses, a lot of buildings, a lot of people, but 14 churches, oh. eight neighborhood associations. Uh, five schools, private and public, uh, one business association with 365 businesses downtown, um, uptown, Jack's Ballpark, uh, Solicito Ballpark. So I'm excited. Uh, and I just came away saying, gosh, we have a great city. We really do. I'm a lot of places and I do travel and I work out of town. There's no other place that I would want to live and work than Monterey. And I'm so impressed by being able to go out and see that and get out of the car and walk it and talk it and, and just see. We, uh, we have a special place and it's worth preserving. It's worth cherishing and celebrating all of the things that come together to make a community. And uh, appreciate everybody's calling tonight and participating. And especially when I shout out to our city manager, who uh, is long-term, 25 years, congratulations, that's significant. And I remember when Pawn started and I was working for the police department in uh, 1997, probably working midnight shift as a sergeant somewhere. Uh, but Hans was an asset from the first day he started and he still is. So congratulations on your 25 years. And thanks to you and all the staff and all the things you do to help serve this council and serve the community. But thank you. Thank you, everybody, for uh, excellent comments. So last night, I, I don't somehow the timing of the Monterey uh, Water District and City Council meetings are one right after another. And this senior millennial can get a little bit worn out from that. Yeah. But I will tell you a very interesting meeting last night. Uh, the Water District's very involved in pr helping produce water. And the consumers, all of us, are conserving water more than before. Tyler knows this, that uh, Pure Water Monterey, our water rate recycling, <clears throat> is up and running and meaning its goal of 3,500 acre feet of year, a year. And hopefully we'll have phase two coming along soon. Something that actually surprised that it interests me, having been around government and teaching for so long, 
and all the strategic plans we've looked at. And I'm, many of you are shaking your heads, yeah. But we did a kind of a mid-year review of our value drivers and what we've accomplished. It was, it was quite an interesting exercise. You can take a look at the website to learn about that. Might be something we wanna do at a study session. And finally, the, the big decision was, you may have read that Montage Chomp is wanting to build another building at Ryan Ranch. It would be a cancer and or uh, heart specialty center. And here we go again in water, but the um, district did decide to look at Montage, all of its properties as one entity versus site specific. And that enables uh, water to be moved from one site to another, even if they're not contiguous, all within the allocation that's given to CHOMP. So that's gonna make that building possible. Mm -hmm. that, that I thought was really exciting and creative. Uh, city manager reports. Um, Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I uh, just wanted to say that the nominations for the upcoming election in November for council members are now open and end on August 12, sharp at 5 p.m. Um, also open is the sports center slide. Um, yeah, I saw that. Uh, we have a firefighter. Uh, out uh, to the Washburn fire that is uh, the first uh, call out in quite a while to a uh, state fire so one one of our firefighters uh, left yesterday morning to the Washburn fire and uh, I want to give a primer we will have the Wi-Fi uh, I'm sorry the wireless ordinance in front of the planning commission on August 9th uh, for another hearing. So that is progressing now as well with respect to the wireless. And I wanted to remind council, we still would like to get into closed session. Yes, I know we're gonna go closed session. Thank you for that. Yes, yeah, so uh, as uh, council member Dan suggested, very much want to adjourn in memory of Jim Harrison when I was uh, started my teaching career in 1968. I, Jim must have been the superintendent. And you know what impressed me most about him as a young teacher and throughout my career? He made teachers feel valued and important. And wow, what does that do for morale? And he just did it naturally. He was very special. So we will uh, adjourn to close session in memory of Dr. Jim Harrison. Thank you, everybody, for another stimulating meeting. <laughs> See you shortly in closed session. Were there any public comments about closed session? We have, don't want to forget that. Thank you. None here in city council chambers, Mr. Mayor. Anybody online? No, not online. Okay, we will adjourn in memory of Dr. Jim Harrison. See you shortly on a, on a different